Hi there. You're in the lab with your mate JJ. Today is Old Book Teardown Day. I think uh, <coughs> old books are my favourite feature of the show. Been looking forward to doing this one for a while now. So uh, it's uh, uh, Radio Engineering by Terman, third edition, published by McGraw Hill. I uh, I got a comment on the channel from one of my viewers who told me that uh, if you studied uh, electrical engineering back in the old days, um, the textbook would have been written by Terman. He was a real uh, uh, sort of prolific and venerable author of his day. Um, we see here that, that this book is copyright 1932, 1937, and 1947. So <clears throat> this was the third edition published in 1947. The second edition having been published in 1937 and the first edition in 1932. So definitely lo looking forward to having you go through this epic tome. So let's pop over to the bench and get on with it. Here we are on the bench. This is our book, McGraw-Hill Electrical and Electronic Engineering Series. We already, uh, we already did one book from this series on the channel. Uh, so this is the second one. Uh, Terman is the author. Radio Engineering is the name of the book uh, and also the name of the subject the book covers. Uh, it's published by McGraw-Hill and this is the third edition. Um, there's no information on the back. It's uh, missing its uh, dust jacket. <coughs> Seems to have come from a place called Barker's Bookstore. Barker's Bookstore in Brisbane, Queensland, which is in Australia, of course, up in the north. Now, uh, this is the same information. Uh, the quality of the materials used in the manufacture of this book is governed by continued post-war shortages. Isn't that fascinating? So they had post-war shortage of paper, and it's affected the quality of the paper of the book. Fascinating. Uh, I can't imagine these days that any brand would give you a disclaimer like that. They'd probably just cover it up. So, uh, Radio Engineering by Frederick Emmons Terman, SCD, Professor, Professor of Electrical Engineering and Dean of the School of Engineering, Stanford University past president of the Institute of Radio Engineers, third edition, second impression, published in New York and London by McGraw-Hill Book Company, 1947. <clears throat> and again, the, um, the copyright, 1932 for the first edition, 1937 for the second edition, and 1947 for this, the third edition. All published by the McGraw-Hill Company, printed in the United States of America, all rights reserved. This book or parts thereof may not be reproduced in any form without permission of the publishers. Uh, the Maple Press Company, York, PA. Preface to the third edition. The present edition of the Radio Engineering has been entirely rewritten to take into account the important advances and the many changes in emphasis that have occurred in the radio field during the last 10 years. Well, I think we'll definitely be reading the preface. This is the preface to the third edition. And then there's a preface to the first edition, but no preface to the second edition. Uh, and here is the table of contents, which we'll be taking a close look at shortly. Wow, it's a pretty extensive book. And there we go, cracking on chapter one. Um, before we really hook in, let's just figure out what we're dealing with. Oh, look at this. We've got a table of values in the back of the book. Excellent. We'll have a close look at that at the end. And here's our index. Index begins 
Oh, these are problems. Problems, problems. The solutions to problems. The index begins on page 953. So this thing is nearly a thousand pages long. It's going to be a long video. We might as well just take it as it comes. We'll read the we'll read the preface. To, we'll read both of the prefaces. Then we'll go through the table of contents, and then we'll go through the book. So uh, this is the preface to the third edition. I already began reading this earlier, but I might as well just start again. The present, <clears throat> the present edition of Radio Engineering has been entirely rewritten to take into account the important advances and the many changes in emphasis that have occurred in the, occurred in the radio field during the last 10 years. In particular, greatly increased attention is given to ultra-high frequency and microwave techniques, also to wideband and pulse methods such as are encountered in television and radar. A chapter on circuits with distributed constants has <coughs> been added that summarizes the principal properties of transmission lines, waveguides, and cavity resonators. The material on electron tubes has been expanded to include electron optics, trans transit time effects, and new tubes such as the reflex klystron, magnetron, and traveling wave tube. The selection of subject matter reflects the <coughs> current activity in frequency modulation, television, pulse techniques, and in the exploitation of the higher frequency parts of the spectrum that have been recently opened up. The numerous war developments <coughs> are covered primarily through the techniques involved in them that have general applicability to communication and electronics. The large amount of new knowledge developed in recent years in the electronic field has necessitated some modifications in the plan of presentation. Specifically, the attempt is made in the present edition to concentrate on the presentation and explanation of fundamental engineering principles having fairly general applicability in the electronic field, with particular reference to radio. Reference material, where in conflict with this objective, has been omitted. <coughs> That's omitted, not included. In particular, it is felt that the availability of the author's Radio Engineer's Handbook reduces the necessity of providing extensive references to literature and of including topics merely for the sake of completeness. Also, whereas the first edition of Radio Engineering in 1932 presented a relatively complete survey of then-current engineering practice, as well as radio systems and the engineering considerations involved in their evolution, the electronic industry has now developed in so many directions that it is impractical pr to present even a superficial survey of such matters in a work of this character. Accordingly, this edition by plan, concentrates increasingly on fundamental principles underlying these systems and the few specific transmitter, receiver, television and radar systems that are induced, introduced merely serve as representative examples of ways in which the fundamental principles can be combined to achieve a desired result. Finally, advantage is taken of the fact that some of the concepts that were first presented in organized form in the first edition 15 years ago, notably the development of tuned circuit and tuned amplifier theory from the concept of circuit Q and universal resonance curves, the use of simplified equivalent circuits, circuits and the 70.7% points as a basis of resistance coupled amplifier theory, etc., are now sufficiently generally understood that they can present, be presented more concisely than was previously considered desirable. By these means, it has been possible in this edition to take into account the enormous changes that have taken place in electronics in recent years without increasing the length of the book appreciably. In fact, the increased number of pages is accounted for almost entirely by the new chapter on circuits with 
distributed constants. By discriminating and well in, uh, <coughs> the discriminating and well-informed reader will undoubtedly find many topics representing fields of knowledge recently developed that to his way of thinking are not adequately treated. In these cases, the author offers no apologies, but merely wishes to point out that this revision has been compiled during the period when the war acquired knowledge is just beginning to become available in convenient form, and before there has been an opportunity to evaluate fully this material and integrate it with the appropriate emphasis into the mainstream of electronic knowledge. A number of individuals and organisations have helped in one way and another in the preparation of this edition. Acknowledgement is made particularly to Robert A. Helliwell and Skipworth W. Athey, Assistant Professors of Electrical Engineering at Stanford University, who assisted in the revision of chapters 13 and 18, respectively, and to Dr. Carl Spang uh, Spangenberg, Professor of Electrical Engineering at Stanford University for making available the manuscript of his book, Vacuum Tubes. Assistance in the preparation of the manuscript has been received from W. W. Harmon, Ellis Roney, L. F. McGee, Fred J. Kappenhoffner, all students <coughs> at Stanford University. Dr. J. M. Petit, Associate Professor of Electrical Engineering, made important contributions to the problems. Finally, thanks are due to Farnsworth Radio and Television, the Western Electric Company, Radio Cor Corporation of America, General Electric Company, Zenith Radio Corporation, and the National Broadcasting Company for supplying information useful in creation in eh, useful in certain of the illustrations and discussions of commercial practices. In a work of this type, some mistakes in text, equations, and curves always occur, no matter how much care is taken. Where these are found, the author would appreciate their being called to his attention so that subsequent printi printings may be corrected. Frederick Emmons Terman, Stanford University, California, September 1947. I'm just going to take a quick break. I'm back. Let's uh, continue. We're up to the uh, preface to the first edition, which I will remind you was written in 1932, I believe it was. Just check. 1932, 15 years earlier. <clears throat> the aim of radio engineering is to present a comprehensive engineering treatment of the more important vacuum tube and radio phenomena. Electrical circuits and vacuum tubes behave according to exact laws, which in the main are simple and easily understood, and which can be used to predict the performance of radio circuits and radio apparatus with the same certainty and accuracy that the performance of other types of electrical equipment, such as transformers, motors, and transmission lines, is analyzed. It is this ability to reduce a problem to quantitative relations that predict with accuracy the performance <clears throat> to be expected or explain the results already obtained that represents a real mastery of the subject such as the radio engineer is expected to possess. The principal prerequisite for uh, undertaking the study of radio engineering is a good working knowledge of the fundamental concepts of alternating current, such as reactance, impedance, power factor, phase angle, and vector representation. An elementary idea of complex quantity notation is also desirable, but not absolutely essential. This means that ra radio work, as outlined in this volume, can be taken up in the senior year of the usual electrical engineering curriculum. <clears throat> the order of presentation has been intentionally so arranged that the first part of the volume is devoted to the theory of tuned circuits and the fundamental properties of vacuum tubes and vacuum tube applications, all of which are of importance and interest to every electrical engineer. The latter part then takes up more specialized radio topics such as radio receivers and transmitters, wave propagation, antennas, and direction finding. This makes it possible, where desired, to arrange a two-semester course, the first term of which will be suitable for all electrical engineers, with the second term continuing 
for those with definite radio interests. Particular care has been taken to avoid unnecessary equations in developing the analytical side of the various subjects taken up. It has been the author's experience that the usual student, when first coming in contact with a new subject, is confused by the presence of numerous equations and, in such circumstances, frequently fails to realise which relations are of real importance. By carrying on the reasoning in terms of words as far as possible, by judicious use of footnotes, and by skipping over purely routine mathematical manipulations, it has been possible to cut down the number of equations appearing in the text to the point where <coughs> the important mathematical relations stand out by virtue of the fact that they stand nearly alone, free of attention-diverting trivial equations. The result is that while radio engineering appears <coughs> to be relatively free from mathematics, yet it actually carries the analysis much deeper than is customary. A typical illustration of this is the treatment of the transformer coupled amplifier given in chapter 5. As far as the author is aware, this represents the only published analysis that can be used to predict the complete amplification characteristic of the transformer coupled amplifier without an unreasonable amount of work and with engineering accuracy. At the same time, it is <clears throat> almost devoid of mathematics as compared with the incomplete and often incorrect treatment ordinarily found. This result has been achieved by carrying the reasoning along in terms <clears throat> of physical concepts and words and by writing down an equation only when the equation itself is of importance. A considerable quantity of original material is being published here for the first time. Notable instances of this are the analysis of the transformer coupled amplifier mentioned above, the universal resonance curve, the class A power amplifier formulas, analysis of the class B linear power amplifier, the analysis of regeneration resulting from a common plate impedance, the concept of the effective Q, of the tuned amplifier, the analysis of the input admit admittance of amplifiers, the treatment <coughs> of the voltage and current relations existing in the screen grid tube, <coughs> and the approximate analysis of rectifier filter systems having a shunt condenser across the filter input. The footnote references form an integral part of the text and have been carefully selected with a view toward helping the reader who desires more information on a particular subject than is given in this volume. No attempt has been made to compile complete bibliographies, the aim having been rather to cite a limited number of comprehensive articles that are really readable by the average student. The author wishes to acknowledge the very helpful cooperation which has been received on all sides. Particular mention should be made of Philip G. Cladwell, the late Nathaniel R. Morgan, Paul F. Byrne, uh, Dr. Horace E. Overacker, William R. Triplett, Harry Engwich, W. G. Wagner, and D. A. Murray, all former students at Stanford University who assisted in drawing the figures and checking the manuscript and proof. The author is also greatly indebted to the Bell Telephone Laboratories, the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, the General Radio Company, the DeForest Radio Company, the General Electric Company, RCA Radiotron Incorporated, and the Stromberg Carlson Telephone Manufacturing Company for supplying copy for certain of the illustrations. Frederick Emmons Terman, Stanford University, California, August 1932. Contents. So, uh, the preface uh, to the third edition and the preface to the fourth edition, we've been through the, uh, the first edition rather, been through those. So there's uh, how many chapters? A lot of chapters. 18 chapters. Uh, and then there's solutions to the problems on page 895. Wow. Alright, well, let's go through the table of contents. Chapter 1. The elements of a system of radio communication. Radio waves. 
Radiation of electrical energy. Generation and control of radio frequency power. Reception of radio signals. Nature of a modulated wave. The decibel. Chapter 2. Circuit elements. Inductance. Mutual inductance and coefficient of coupling. Skin effect in coils and conductors at radio frequencies. Condensers and dielectrics. Condensers for radio use. Coils for resonant circuits. Shielding of magnetic and electrostatic fields. Chapter 3. Properties of circuits with lumped constants. Series resonance. Parallel resonance. Inductively coupled circuits. Theory. Analysis of some typical inductively coupled circuits. Generalized coupled circuits. Band pass filters. Thevenin's theorems. Impedance matching. Chapter 4. Circuits with distributed constants. Fundamental relations in transmission lines. Transmission line behavior in terms of incident and reflectant waves. Transmission line constants. Impedance and power factor relations in transmission lines. Properties of transmission lines with zero losses. Transmission line charts. Transmission lines as resonant circuits and as circuit elements. Artificial lines. Use of transmission lines in impedance matching and as transformers. Miscellaneous aspects of transmission lines. Waveguides, general considerations. Rectangular waveguides. Circular waveguides. Standing waves, reflection, and impedance consideration in waveguides. Miscellaneous considerations and properties in waveguides. Cavity resonators. Chapter 5. Fundamental properties of electron tubes. Electron tubes. Electrons, ions, and their motions. Thermionic emission of electrons. Secondary emission. Diodes, space charge effects. Triodes, action of the control grid. Coefficients of triode tubes. Pentodes, screen grid tetrode tubes. Beam tubes. Coefficients of pentode, screen grid, and beam tubes. Mathematical representation of characteristic curves of tubes. Conventional high vacuum tubes, miscellaneous. High frequency and transit time effects in diode, triode, and pentode tubes. Electron optics, electrostatic lenses. Magnetic lenses, cathode ray tubes, gas tubes, microwave tubes, klystrons, magnetrons, and traveling wave tubes. Chapter 6, vacuum tube amplifiers employing untuned untuned load impedances <clears throat> vacuum tube amplifiers equivalent circuit of the vacuum tube amplifier resistance coupled amplifiers transformer coupled amplifiers video frequency wideband voltage amplifiers amplitude distortion in amplifiers analysis based on graphical methods Mathematical analysis of am amplitude distortion and cross-modulation in amplifiers. Resistance coupled and video amplifiers designed for large output voltages. Class A power amplifiers. <coughs> output transformers in Class A amplifiers. Push-pull Class A amplifiers. Class B and Class AB audio frequency power amplifiers. Cathode follower amplifiers. Feedback amplifiers. Miscellaneous considerations in untuned amplifiers. Chapter 7. Tuned amplifiers. Tuned voltage amplifiers, narrow band case. Tuned amplifiers, wide band case. Input, admis uh, input admittance of vacuum tube amplifiers. Class C tuned amplifiers. Harmonic generators. Linear amplifiers. Class C and similar operation at ultra-high frequencies. The traveling wave tube. Chapter 8. Vacuum tube oscillators. 
conventional vacuum tube oscillator circuits, frequency and frequency stability of generated oscillations, crystal oscillators, ultra high frequency oscillators, laboratory oscillators, parasitic oscillations, reflex klystrons, power klystron oscillators and frequency multipliers, magnetron oscillators. Chapter 9 Modulation Waves with Amplitude Modulation Plate Modulated Class C Amplifiers Miscellaneous Systems of Amplitude Modulation Carrier Suppression Systems and Single Side Band Generation Frequency Modulated Waves Representation of Amplitude, Frequency and Phase Modulated Waves by Means of Rotating Vectors Production of Frequency and Phase Modulated Waves Responsive networks to frequency modulated waves. Chapter 10 Vacuum tube detectors and mixers. Detection of amplitude modulated waves. Diode detectors for amplitude modulated waves. Miscellaneous methods for detection of amplitude modulated waves. Crystal detectors. Vacuum tube voltmeters. Detection of frequency and phase modulated signals. Frequency translation, heterodyne detection. Frequency mixer and converted tubes for superheterodyne receivers. Crystal and diode mixers. Miscellaneous. Chapter 11 Sources of power for operating vacuum tubes. Cathode heating power. Control grid bias voltage. Sources of anode power. Rectifiers for supplying anode power. Rectifier circuits. Behavior of rectifiers when used with filter systems having series inductance input. Behavior of rectifiers when used with filter systems having shunt condenser input. Filters. Examples of rectifier filter calculations. Vibrator power supply systems. Voltage regulated power supply systems. Chapter 12. Miscellaneous aspects of tubes and circuits. Thermal agitation noise, tube noise, relaxation oscillators, frequency division, trigger circuits, generation of special wave shapes, generation of time delays, counting circuits. Chapter 13 Propagation of radio waves. General picture of factors involved in propagation of radio waves. The ground wave. Space wave propagation with particular reference to very high frequencies. Reflection of radio waves. The ion ionosphere. Physical mechanism by which ionosphere affects radio wave propagation. Theory of sky wave propagation. Measurement of ionosphere characteristics. Propagation characteristics of radio waves of different frequencies in relation to the problems of practical radio communication. Relation of solar activity and meteorological conditions to the propagation of radio waves. Noise and static. rayleigh carson recipro Reciprocity Theorem. Chapter 14. Antennas. Fundamental considerations relating to radiation from wires. Fundamental consideration in the directional characteristics of antenna systems composed of wire radiators remote from ground. Effect of ground, grounded antennas. Arrays of arrays, array factors. Antenna impedance, mutual impedance and phasing. Power relations in antennas. Radiation resistance, directivity and gain. Some directional systems of particular interest. Aperture radiators. Broadband considerations in transmitting antennas. Practical transmitting antennas. Fundamental properties of receiving antennas and reciprocal relations existing between transmitting and receiving properties. Practical receiving antennas. Chapter 15. Radio transmitters, receivers and communication systems. Transmitters. General considerations. Amplitude modulated transmitters for radio, telephone and similar applications. Frequency modulated transmitters for radio, telephone and similar signals. Radio telegraph transmitters. 
radio receivers, general considerations. Broadcast receivers, miscellaneous features relating to broadcast receivers. Receivers and receiver techniques for other than broadband, uh, other than broadcast purposes. Receiver noise, noise and interference reduction in frequency modulation systems. Pulse communication systems, radio relay systems. Chapter 16, radio aids to navigation and radar. Radar, radar transmitting system. Radar antennas. Radar receiving systems. Radar beacons. Pulse navigation systems, low RAN and G. Radio ultimate, ultimeters. Radio range. Airplane landing systems, radio direction finding. Chapter 17, television. Elements of a system of television. Television pickup tubes, scanning, synchronization, and blanking. Frequency band and resolution. Television transmitters, television receivers, color television. Chapter 18, sound and sound equipment. Characteristics of audible sounds, characteristics of the human ear, elements of acoustics, effects of distortion in the reproduction of sound, dynamic loudspeakers employing paper cones, horns, loudspeakers, miscellaneous considerations, the telephone receiver, microphones. Then there's problems, <coughs> solutions to problems, presumably, on page 895, and the index begins on page 953. I'm going to take a quick break, and then we'll go on with the book. On we go. So, uh, <coughs> I guess I might just start reading out chapter one, uh, <coughs> and then we'll just flip through the book and uh, maybe have a look at uh, some of the pictures and equations and such. So this is chapter one, the elements of a system of radio communication. Radio waves. Electrical energy that has escaped into free space exists in the form of electromagnetic waves. These waves, which are commonly called radio waves, travel with the velocity of light and consist of magnetic and electrostatic fields at right angles to each other and also at right angles to the direction of travel. <coughs> if these electrostatic and magnetic fluxes could actually be seen, the wave would have the appearance indicated in figure 1.1. One half of the electrical energy contained in the wave exists in the form of electrostatic energy, while the remaining half is in the form of magnetic energy. So, uh, front view, through plane, and side view. Figure 1.1, front and side views of a vertically polarized wave. The solid lines represent electrostatic flux. The dotted lines and the circles indicate magnetic flux. <clears throat> the essential properties of a radio wave are the frequency, intensity, direction of travel, and plane of polarization. The radio waves produced by an alternating current will vary in intensity with the frequency of the current and will therefore be alternately positively and neg uh, positive and negative as shown in figure 1.1b. The distance occupied by one complete cycle of such an alternating wave is equal to the velocity of the wave divided by the number of cycles that are sent out each second and is called the wavelength. The relation between the wavelength lambda in meters and frequency f in cycles per second is therefore uh, lambda equals the <laughs> velocity of light divided by the frequency. Uh, the quantity uh, 300 million is the velocity of light in meters per second. The frequency, 
frequency is ordinarily expressed in kilocycles, abbreviated KC, or in megacycles, abbreviated MC. Low frequency, <clears throat> a low frequency wave is seen from equa uh, equation 1.1 to have a long wavelength, while a high frequency corresponds to a short wavelength. The strength of a radio wave is measured in terms of the voltage stress produced in space by the electrostatic field of the wave and is usually expressed in microvolts stress per meter. Since the actual stress produced at any point by an alternating wave varies sinusoidally from instant to instant, it is customary to consider the intensity of such a wave to, to be the effective value of the stress, which is 0 0.707 times the maximum stress in the atmosphere during the cycle. The strength of the wave <coughs> measured in terms of microvolts per meter of stress in space is exactly the same voltage that the magnetic flux of the wave induces in a conductor one meter long when sweeping across this conductor with the velocity of light. Thus the strength of a wave is not only the dielectric stress produced in space by the electrostatic field, but it also represents the voltage that the magnetic field of the wave will induce in cutting across a conductor. In fact, the voltage stress produced by the wave can be considered as resulting from the movement of the magnetic flux of the same wave. The minimum field strength required to give satisfactory reception of a wave depends upon a number of factors such as frequency, type of signal involved, and amount of interference present. Under some conditions, radio waves having signal strengths as low as 0.1 microvolts per meter are usable. Occasionally, signal strengths as great as 5,000 to 30,000 microvolts per meter are required to ensure entirely satisfactory reception at all times. In most cases, the weakest useful signal strength lies somewhere between these extremes. A plane parallel to the mutually perpendicular lines of electrostatic and electromagnetic flux is called the wave front. The wave always travels in a direction at right angles to the wave front, but whether it goes forward or backward depends upon the relative direction of the lines of electromagnetic and electrostatic flux. If the direction of either the magnetic or electrostatic flux is re reversed, the direction of travel is reversed but reversing both sets of flux has no effect. The direction of the electrostatic lines of flux is called the direction of polarization of the wave. If the electrostatic flux lines are vertical, as shown in figure 1, 1, the wave is vertically polarized. When the electrostatic flux lines are horizontal and the electromagnetic flux lines are vertical, the wave is horizontally polarized. Propagation of radio waves of different frequencies. As radio waves <coughs> travel away from their point of origin, they become attenuated or weakened. This is due in part to the fact that the waves spread out. In addition, however, energy may be absorbed from the waves by the ground or by ionized regions in the upper atmosphere. And the waves may also be reflected or refracted by the Earth by ionized regions in the upper atmosphere or by conditions within the lower atmosphere. The resulting situation is quite complex and differs greatly for radio waves of different frequency, as shown in Table 1.1, which summarizes the behavior of different classes of radio waves. It's interesting. So, so Table got, oh, we've got this, this pages are sticking together. Oh, that page probably hasn't been open for what, what do you reckon, 20, 30? How many years do you reckon since someone read this book? Table 1.1 Classification of radio waves So we've got the class, the frequency range, the wavelength range, propagation characteristics, and typical uses. So, very low frequency, VLF. Frequency range, 10 to 30 kilocycles. Wavelength range, 30,000 to 10,000 meters. Propagation characteristics, low, attenu uh, low attenuation at all times of day and of year, characteristics very reliable. Typical uses, long distance, point to point, high power communication requiring continuous operation. Low frequency, LF, 30 to 300 kilocycles. 
uh, 10,000 meters to 1,000 meters. Uh, propagation characteristics. Propagation at night, similar to VLF, but slightly less reliable. Daytime absorption greater than VLF increases with frequency and more variable from day to day and season to season. Suitable typical uses, long distance point to point service, marine navigational aids. Medium frequency, MF. 300 to 3000 kilocycles, 1100 meters wavelength, attenuation low at night and high in daytime, greater in summer than in winter, in general propagation over appreciable distance, less reliable than at lower frequencies and increasingly so as frequency becomes greater. Typical uses, broadcasting, marine communication, navigation, airplane communication, police radio, harbor telephone, etc. High frequency, 3 to 30 um, uh, megacycles, okay, and that's uh, 110 meters wavelength. Uh, transmission over a considerable distance depends solely on the ionization in the upper atmosphere and so varies greatly with time of day and season. Attenuation at moderate to great distance, extremely small under favorable conditions, uh, very great under unfavorable conditions. Typical uses, moderate and long distance communication of all types. Very high frequency, VHF, uh, 30 to 300 megacycles or 10 to 1 meters. Substantially straight line <coughs> propagation analogous to that of light waves uh, unaffected by ionosphere. Uh, typical uses, short distance communication, television, frequency modulation, radar, airplane navigation. Uh, ultra high frequency, UHF, uh, 300 to 3000 megacycles. <coughs> per, um, and then uh, the, the uh, wavelength range is uh, uh, 110 centimeters. Um, substantially straight line propagation analogous to that of light waves unaffected by ionosphere. Um, short distance communication, radar, relay systems, television, etc. Band not fully exploited. Okay. And uh, super high frequency, SHF, 3,000 to 30,000 megacycles. And uh, that's 10 to 1 centimeters. Um, and it's the same as uh, UHF. There you go. <sighs> that across a bit. So, radiation of electrical energy. Every electrical circuit carrying alternating current radiates a certain amount of electrical energy in the form of electromagnetic waves, but the amount of energy thus radiated is is extremely small unless all the dimensions of the circuit approach the order of magnitude of a wavelength. Thus, <clears throat> a power line carrying 60 cycle current with a 20 foot spacing between conductors will radiate practically no energy because a wavelength at 60 cycles is more than 3000 miles and 20 feet is negligible in comparison. On the other hand, a coil 20 feet in diameter and carrying a 2000 kilocycle current will radiate a considerable amount of energy because 20 feet is comparable with <coughs> the 150 meter wavelength of the radio wave. From these considerations it is apparent that the size of radiator required is inverse inversely proportional to the frequency. High frequency waves can therefore be produced by a small radiator, while low frequency waves require a large antenna system for effective radiation. Every radiator has directional characteristics as a result of which it, ten it sends out stronger waves in certain directions than in others. Directional characteristics of antennas are used to concentrate the radiation towards the point to which it is desired to transmit or to favor reception of energy arriving from a particular direction. Generation and control of radio frequency power. The radio frequency power required by a radio transmitter is practically always obtained from a vacuum tube oscillator or amplifier. 
vacuum tubes can convert direct current power into alternating current <coughs> energy for all frequencies from the very lowest up to 30,000 megacycles or even greater. Under most conditions, the efficiency with which this transformation takes place is in the neighborhood of 50% or higher. At frequencies up to well over 1,000 megacycles, the amount of power that can be generated continuously by vacuum tubes is of the order of kilowatts. Modulation. The transmission of information by radio waves requires that some means be employed to control the radio waves by the desired intelligence. One way to do this, termed amplitude modulation, is to vary the amplitude of the radio radiated wave in accordance with the intelligence to be transmitted. In radio telegraphy, this involves turning the radio transmitter on and off in accordance with the dots and dashes of the telegraph code as illustrated in figure 12b. In radio telephone transmission by amplitude modulation, the radio frequency wave is varied in accordance with the pressure of the sound wave being transmitted as shown in figure 12e. Similarly, in picture transmission, the amplitude of the wave radiated at any one time is made proportional to the light intensity of the part of the picture that is being transmitted at that instant. There you go. So, um, <coughs> this is uh, figure 1-2, diagram showing how a signal may be transmitted by modulating the amplitude of a radio wave and how the original signal may be recovered from the modulated wave by rectification. For the sake of clarity, the radio frequency is shown as being much lower than would usually be the case. Right. So there you go. So there's a telegraph cable signal. <coughs> radio wave after modulation by telegraph code signal and then modulated waves after rectification showing average values. Sound vibration, radio wave after modulation and F modulated waves after rectification showing average values. Fascinating. Yeah, right. See, this is this is cool. This is the way. Uh, see, when you, when you that's your input, and that's what the wave does. And th to receive the signal, you just chop off the bottom bit. You just chop off the bottom bit, and the top bit has the uh, the the thing in it. And all you need in order to chop off the bottom bit is a diode because the diode only allows the current to flow one way so when it tries to go the other way it just gets stopped so you know it's a diode and they call it a rectifier it's a, it's a rectifier <sighs> did I already read that out it's the diagram showing how a signal may be transmitted by modulating the amplitude of a radio wave and how the original signal may be recovered from the modulated wave by rectification. For the sake of clarity, the radio frequency shown is being much lower than would usually be the case. Yeah, fair enough. All right. And then we've got amplitude modulated wave. And, oh, hang on. Okay, figure one, three. Character of waves produced, character of waves produced by amplitude modulation and by frequency modulation, where the modulation is sinusoidal in both cases. For the sake of clarity, the radio frequency is shown much lower than would usually be the case. Okay. There you go. Very cool. So on the top is AM, and on the bottom is FM. On we go. Intelligence may be transmitted by other means than by varying the amplitude. 
For example, one may maintain the amplitude constant and vary the frequency that is radiated in accordance with the intelligence, thus obtaining frequency modulation. This results in a wave such as shown in 13b as compared with the corresponding amplitude modulation of figure 13a. Frequency modulation has many advantages and is widely used in very high frequency communication systems. 1.4. Reception of radio signals. In the reception of radio signals, it is first necessary to abstract energy from the radio waves <coughs> passing the receiving point. After this has been done, the radio receiver must next separate the desired signal from other signals that may be present and then reproduce the original intelligence from the radio waves. In addition, arrangements are ordinarily provided for amplification of the received energy so that the output of the radio receiver can be greater than the energy abstracted from the wave. Any antenna system capable of radiating electrical energy is also able to abstract energy from a passing radio wave because the electromagnetic flux of the wave in cutting across the antenna conductors induces a voltage that varies with time in exactly the same way as the current flowing in the antenna radiating the wave. The energy represented by the current flowing in the receiving antenna system is abstracted from the passing wave and will be greatest when the reactance of the antenna system has been reduced to a minimum by making the antenna circuit resonant to the frequency of the wave to be received. Since every wave passing the receiving antenna induces its own voltage in the antenna conductor, it is necessary that the receiving equipment be capable of separating the desired signal from the unwanted signals that are also inducing voltages in the antenna. This separation is made on the basis of the difference in frequency between transmitting stations and is carried out by the use of resonance circuits which can be made to discriminate very strongly in favour of a particular frequency. It has already been pointed out that by making the antenna circuit resonant to a particular frequency, the energy abstracted from the radio waves of that frequency will be much greater than the energy from waves of other frequencies. This alone gives a certain amount of separation between signals. Still greater selective action can be obtained by the use of additional suitably adjusted resonant circuits located somewhere in the receiver in such a way as to reject all but the desired signal. The ability to discriminate between radio waves of different frequencies is called selectivity and the process of adjusting circuits to resonance with the frequency of a desired signal is spoken of as tuning. Although intelligible radio signals have been received from stations thousands of miles distant, using only the energy abstracted from the radio wave by the receiving antenna, much more satisfactory reception can be obtained if the receiving energy is amplified. The amplification may be applied to the radio frequency currents before detection, in which case <coughs> it is called radio frequency amplification, or it may be applied to the rectified currents after detection, which is called audio frequency amplification. The use of amplification makes possible the satisfactory reception of signals from waves that would otherwise be too weak to give <coughs> an audible response. The only satisfactory method of amplifying radio signals that has been discovered is by the use of vacuum tubes. Uh, before such tubes were discovered, radio reception had available only the energy abstracted from the radio wave by the receiving antenna. Detection. The process by which the signal being transmitted is reproduced from the radio frequency currents present in the receiver is called detection or sometimes demodulation where the intelligence is transmitted by varying the amplitude of the radiated wave, detection is accomplished by rectifying the radio frequency currents. The rectified <coughs> current thus produces, in accordance with the signal originally modulated on the wave radiate, radiated at the transmitter and so reproduces the desired signal. Thus when the modulated wave at shown at E in figure 1-2 is rectified the result <coughs> resulting current is shown at F and is seen to have an average value that varies in accordance with the amplitude of the original signal. Uh, do you want to have a look at that picture again? We, we did talk about it when we saw it. So yeah you can see that uh, uh, we're talking about intelligent uh, what the uh, modulated wave is shown at E yes okay 
that's frequency modulated wave at E. Uh, 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 so thus when the modulated wave shown at, at E of figure 1, 2 is rectified, the resulting current is shown at F and is seen to have an average value that varies in accordance with the amplitude of the original signal. So I'm talking about here how that basically looks like that. It's, it's recovered the original signal from the frequency modulated. Uh, Oh no, 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 sorry. Yeah, okay. This is amplitude mod uh, modulation, amplitude modulation. And this is, this is how uh, AM it, uh, encodes a, 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 a sound wave. Whereas, yeah, so both of these are AM, we're talking about AM. Um, this is frequency modulation we get to later, but this is amplitude mo modulation. Uh, you can see the frequency is the same and the amplitude varies and you can encode a telegraph signal or you can encode a sound signal. So that's what that's about. And this process here where we go from here to here, that's rectification and it's done by means of a diode. <clears throat> or maybe it used to be a, a, some other uh, sort of a tube system, I'm not sure. And then of course they mentioned amplifiers, so we're going to be talking about amplifiers at some point. And the, they said there's... Uh, uh, amplification to the radio frequency currents uh, is called radio frequency amplif amplification otherwise it's called audio frequency amplification there you go and of course um, radio frequencies are much higher than audio frequencies uh, I suppose that gets important at some point <sighs> on we go in the transmission of code signals by radio, the rectified current produces the dots and dashes of the telegraph code as shown in figure 12C and could be used to operate a telegraph sounder. Uh, when it is desired to receive the telegraph signals directly on a telephone receiver, it is necessary to break up the dots and dashes at an audible rate in order to give a note that can be heard, since otherwise the telephone receiver would give forth a succession of unintelligible clicks. The detection of a frequency modulated wave involves two steps. First, the wave is transmitted through a circuit in which the relative output obtained from the circuit depends upon the frequency. The circuit output is then an amplitude modulated wave since as the frequency of the constant amplitude input wave varies, the output will vary correspondingly. The resulting amplitude modulated wave is then rectified. <coughs> there you go. Nature of a modulated wave. A modulated wave represents not a simple sinusoidal oscillation, but rather an oscillation in which some feature, usually, usually the amplitude or the frequency, varies in accordance with the intelligence that is being transmitted. As a result, a modulated wave consists actually of several waves of slightly different frequencies superimposed upon each other. The actual nature of a modulated wave can be deduced by writing down the equation of the wave and making a mathematical analysis of the result. Thus, in the case of the simple sine wave amplitude modulation shown in figure 13a, the amplitude of the radio frequency oscillation is given by E equals E0 plus ME0 sine 2 pi FST, in which E0 represents the average amplitude, FS, the frequency at which the amplitude is varied, and M, the ratio of amplification variation from the average to the average amplitude, which is called the degree of modulation. The equation of the amplitude modulated wave can be written as that, <laughs> in which F is the frequency of the radio oscillation. Multiplying out the right hand side of equation 1, 2 gives us another equation. By expanding the last term into functions of the sum and difference angles by the usual trigonometric formula, the equation of a wave with simple sine wave amplitude modulation is as shown in equation 1, 3. Equation 1.3 shows that the wave with sine wave modulation consists of the three separate waves. 
The first of these represented by the term E0 sine 2 pi ft is called the carrier. Its amplitude is independent of the presence or absence of modulation and is equal to the average amplitude of the wave, which is independent of the degree of modulation. The other two components are alike as far as magnitude is concerned, but the frequency of one of them is less than that of the carrier frequency and by an amount equal to the modulation frequency, while the frequency of the second is more than that of the carrier by the same amount. These two components are called sideband frequencies and they carry the intelligence that is being transmitted by the modulated wave. The frequency by which the sidebands differ from the carrier frequency represents the modulation frequency, while the amplitude of the sideband components compared with the amplitude of the carrier determines the degree of modulation. That is, the size of the amplitude variations that are impressed upon the radiated wave. When the modulation is more complex than the simple sine wave amplitude variation of figure 13a, the effect is to introduce additional sideband components. Thus, if the wave of a radio telephone transmitter is amplitude modulated by a complex sound wave containing pitches of 1000 and 1500 cycles, the modulated wave will contain one pair of 1000 cycle sideband components and one pair of 1500 cycle sideband components. The analysis of a frequency modulated wave is somewhat more complex but leads to an analogous result. The principal difference is that the frequency modulated wave not only contains the same sideband frequencies as does the corresponding amplitude modulated wave, but in addition contains higher order sidebands. Thus, if a wave has its frequency varied at a rate of 1000 times per second, the resulting modulated wave will contain not only a pair of 1000 cycle sideband components, but in addition a pair of 2000 cycle sideband components, possibly a pair of 3000 sideband cycle sideband components, etc. The amplitude of these various sideband pairs will depend upon the extent and upon the rate of frequency. <coughs> the, uh, upon the rate the frequency is varied. Significance of the sidebands. The carrier and sideband frequencies are not a mathematical fiction, but have a real existence, as is evidenced by the fact that the various frequency components of a mod modulated wave can be separated from each other by suitable filter circuits. The sideband frequencies can be considered as being generated as a result of varying the wave. They are present only when the wave is being varied and their magnitude and frequency are determined by the character of the modulation. It is apparent that the transmission of intelligence requires the use of a band of frequencies rather than a single frequency. This speech, <coughs> in speech and music, there are frequency components as high as 10,000 cycles so that speech and music modulated upon a wave can produce sideband components extending as far as 10,000 cycles on each side of the carrier frequency. A radio telephone station therefore utilizes a frequency, for frequency band about 20,000 cycles wide in transmitting highest quality signals. If this entire band is not transmitted equally well through space and by the circuits through which the modulated wave currents must pass, then the sideband <coughs> frequency components that are discriminated against will not be reproduced in the receiving equipment with proper amplitude. With telegraph signals, the required sideband is relatively narrow because the amplitude of the signals is varied only in a few times a second, but a definite frequency band is still required. If some of the sideband components of the code are not <laughs> transmitted, the received dots and dashes tend to be rounded off and run together and may become indistinguishable. The decibel. The decibel, abbreviated dB, is a logarithmic unit used in communication work to express power ratios. If the powers being compared are P1 and P2, then the decibels is 10 log 10 P2 divided by P1. The sign associated with the number of decibels indicates which power is greater. Thus, a negative sign means P2 is less than P1.
The decibel has no other significance than that given in equation 1 4. Thus, if decibels are used to express amplification, this simply means the presence of the amplification increases the power output by the number of decibels attributed to the amplification. Again, under many conditions, relative power is proportional to the square of the voltage E, or the current I, or the field B, etc. Under these conditions, decibels equals 20 log 10 E2 on E1 equals 20 log 10. Okay, so they're just showing that the decibels is just purely the, the uh, it, it's, it's not a unit, it's just a ratio. These relations must be used with caution, however, as they hold only when the resistance associated with E2 or I2 or B2 is the same as associated with either E1 or I1 or B1. The practical value of the decibel arises from its logarithmic nature. This permits the enormous ranges of power involved in communication work to be expressed in terms of decibels without running in to inconveniently large numbers while at the same time permitting small ratios to be conveniently expressed. Thus one decibel represents a power ratio of approximately 5 to 4 while 60 decibel represents a ratio of about a million to 1. The logarithmic character of a decibel also makes it possible to express the ratio of input to output powers of a complicated circuit as the sum of the decibel equivalent of the ratios of the input to the output powers of the different parts of the circuit that are in cascade. The decibel is also the natural unit for expressing sound intensities since the effect that sound waves have on the ear is roughly proportional to the logarithm of the intensity. A decibel table is printed on the inside back cover of this book for convenient reference. So that's what that table in the back was, a decibel table. Let's stick a bookmark in there and let's go and have a look at it. All right, so this says power, voltage and current ratios for assigned decibel values. <clears throat> and then we've got decibel equivalent of power, voltage, and current ratios. All right. So we've got decibels from 0.1 through to 7.5. <coughs> voltage, <coughs> current and voltage ratio, power ratio. Oh, there we go, and then decibels on we go, and oh, I see. Okay, I was confused because this is quite narrow and that's bigger, but it just got bigger because the numbers got bigger and they're actually the same. So this is just runs all the way down here, and that runs all the way down here. And then this is a separate a separate table. So this is going to show us decibels all the way up to really massive ones. So, okay, decibels at 170 is like 316 times 10 to the 8, which is enormous. All right, let's see what it says here in the fine print. It says... The number of decibels corresponding to ratios outside the range of the table can be obtained by making use of the fact that multiplying the ratio by 10 to the power of n increases the decibel equivalent for power by 10n and for voltage by or current by 20n. Thus a voltage ratio of 2200 corresponds to 2 26.85 plus 40 equals 66.85 decibels, while the power ratio of 2200 corresponds to 13.42 uh, 13 plus 20 equals 33.2 decibels. Similarly, a power ratio of 0 0.22 times 10 to the minus 3 is minus 6.58 minus 30 equals minus 36.58 dB. Alright. So... 
one decibel gain uh, 1.12 loss uh, 0 0.891 <coughs> okay so this is a current and voltage ratio and a power ratio okay still getting my head around all this stuff and what have we got over here oh this is to go the other way so where are the uh, uh, the, the decibels are a ratio right right okay so uh, this is if you've got the ratio how to get the decibel and if you've got the decibel how to get the ratio. So this table inverts this table pretty much. I don't think it covers quite the same range. Yeah, it doesn't cover quite the same range. Interesting. All right. Well, that's what that explains what's in the back of the book. And now we're up to chapter 2. So I suppose we better just start skimming through it or we'll never get done. So on we go. Do we want to know about circuit elements? <clears throat> this is figure 2-1. Flux and current distribution in typical single layer air-cooled induction coil. The current density is indicated by the density of shading. Hmm. So, circuit elements. We've got inductance. Uh, inductance in microhenries equals F n squared D where n is the number of turns D is the diameter of coil measured to the center of wire and F is a constant that depends up only upon the ratio of length to diameter and is given in figure 2 2 this is figure 2 2 and you see how uh, how the uh, constant F is related to uh, the length divided by the diameter all right so, more equations, more charts. When two inductance coils are so placed in relation to each other that flux lines produced by current in one of the coils link with the turns of the other coil as shown in figure 25A, the two inductances are said to be inductively coupled. The effects of <coughs> the effect that this coupling produces can be expressed in terms of a property called the mutual inductance which is defined by the relation as given here okay coefficient of coupling is an equation and then skin effect in coils and conductors at radio frequencies the effective resistance offered by conductors to radio frequencies is considerably more than the ohmic resistance measured with direct currents. This is because of an action known as skin effect, which causes the current to be concentrated in certain parts of the conductor and leaves the remainder of the cross section to contribute little or nothing toward carrying the current. The, a simple example of skin effect, and one that makes its nature clear, is furnished by an isolated round wire. When a current is flowing through such a conductor, the magnetic flux that results is in the form of concentric circles as shown in figure 2.6. It is to be noted that some of this flux exists within the conductor and therefore links with, that is, in circles, current near the center of the conductor while not linking with current flowing near the surface. The result is that the inductance of the central part of the conductor is greater than the inductance of the part of the conductor near the surface because of the greater number of flux linkages existing in the central region. At radio frequencies, the reactance of this extra inductance is sufficiently great to affect seriously the flow of current, most of which flows along the surface of the conductor where the impedance is low, rather than near the center where the impedance is high. 
The centre part of the conductor, therefore, does not carry its share of the current and the true or effective resistance is increased since the effect, <coughs> the useful cross section of the wire is very, since in effect the useful cross section of the wire is very greatly reduced. The actual type of current division, distribution obtained in the case of moderate skin effect in a round wire is shown in figure 2.6. When skin effect is present, the current is always redistributed over the conductor cross section in such a way as to make most of the current flow where it is encircled by the smallest number of flux lines. This general principle controls the distribution of current, irrespective of the shape of the conductor involved. Thus, with a flat strip conductor, such as shown in figure 2.7, the current flows primarily along the edges, where it is surrounded by the smallest amount of flux, <coughs> and the true or effective resistance will be high, because most of the strip carries very little current. The, this illustration makes clear that it is not the amount of conductor surface that determines the resistance to alternating current, but rather the way in which the conductor material is arranged. Uh, the ratio that the effective alternating current resistance bears to the direct current resistance of a conductor is commonly called the resistance ratio. It increases with frequency with conductivity of the conductor material and with the size of the conductor. This results from the fact that a higher frequency causes the extra inductance at the center of the conductor to have a higher reactance, while a greater conductivity makes the reactance of the extra inductance more important in determining the distribution of current of more importance in determining the distribution of current and a greater cross section provides a larger central region. It is to be noted however that a larger conductor always has less radio frequency resistance than a smaller one <coughs> because although the ratio of alternating current to direct current resistance is less favorable this is more than made up by the greater amount of conductor cross section present. Skin effect at high frequencies. As a footnote here, an excellent discussion of skin effect at very high frequencies is given by Harold A. Wheeler, Formulas for the Skin Effect, uh, Proceedings of the IRE, Volume 30, page 412, September 1942. Skin effect at high frequencies. While the frequency is sufficiently high, Oh, sorry, when the, when the frequency is sufficiently high, uh, substantially all of the current in a conductor is confined to a region very close to the surface. The current density then falls off with the depth from the surface in accordance with the relation uh, current at depth Z divided by current at the surface equals epsilon to the power of Z over D. Here's Z and D are in the same units and d is a quantity called the skin depth that is given by the equation d equals 5033 times the square root of p over uf where d is the skin depth in centimeters uh, is that p is resistivity of conductor in ohms per centimeter cubed f is the frequency in cycles and uh, mu is the magnetic permeability of core material the, perme the permeability of air equals 1. For copper at 20 degrees Celsius, this reduces to skin depth of copper in centimeters is 6.62 divided by the square root of F. The phase of the current at depth Z, Z lags the current at the surface by Z on D radians. At a depth from the surface corresponding to one skin depth, the current density is dropped to 36.8% of the value at the surface and the phase of the current lags the current by the sur at the surface by one radian. Equation 2.9 is valid if the effective thickness of the conductor exceeds three to four times the skin depth and when at the same time the skin depth is small compared with the radius of curvature of the conductor surface. 
under conditions where equation 2.9 applies, the power loss associated with the current flowing under the elementary under each elementary air of the conductor surface is exactly the same as though the current present were uniformly distributed to the skin depth D, and then that there were no currents at greater depths instead of the current dropping off gradually from the surface as is actually the case. If the total current flowing along the surface in a strip is I amps per centimeter of width, then equation 2.9 applies. The magnetic flux density B at the surface is B in Gauss's equals 4 pi on 10 times I. This results from the fact that the magnetomotive force produced by a current sheet is 0.4 pi I per centimeter, where I is the current per centimeter flowing in the sheet. Equation 2.12 is useful in determining the power loss in cases where the magnetic flux distribution is known instead of the current distribution, as is the case in cavity resonators and waveguides. Under conditions where the current is uniformly distributed over the circumference of a conductor, as is the case in an isolated conductor, but not in the presence of proximity effect, then the true or effective resistance of the conductor at a very high frequency is given by the equation uh, resistance in ohms per centimeter is uh, P divided by dP, uh, where P is the perimeter of the conductor and the uh, remaining notation is as previously given. For copper conductors, this becomes Resistance in ohm per centimeter length of copper conductor is 26 times the square root of F times 10 to the power of minus 9 over P. Proximity effect. Skin effect in coils. When two or more adjacent conductors are carrying current, the current distribution in one of them is affected by the magnetic flux produced by the adjacent conductor, as well as by the magnetic flux produced by the current in the conductor itself. This effect termed the proximity effect ordinarily causes the true or effective resistance to be greater than in the case of simple skin effect and is particularly important in radio frequency inductance coils. It is because of proximity effect that it is desirable in single layer air cord coils to select a size of wire that does not fill the winding space completely since up to a certain extent this will reduce losses from proximity effect more than it increases the losses due to the smaller wire cross section. It is likewise a reason that a loose winding is desirable in multi-layered air cord coils. The current distribution under conditions where proximity effect is present allows the same law as for simple skin effect. That is, the current density is greatest in those parts of the conductor encircled by the smallest number of flux lines. This is illustrated in figure 2.1 where the approximate current density is illustrated by relative shading. Litz wire. The effective alternating current resistance of a conductor can be made to approach the direct current resistance at low and moderate radio frequencies by forming the conductor from a number of strands of small enameled wires connected in parallel at their ends, but insulated throughout the rest of their length and thoroughly interwoven. If the stranding is properly done, each wire will, on average, link with the same number of flux lines as every other wire, and the current will divide evenly among the strands. If at the same time each strand is of small diameter, it will have relatively little skin effect over its cross section, so all of the material is equally effective at carrying the current. Such a stranded cable is called a Litz conductor. Practical Litz conductors are very effective at frequencies below about 10,000 kilocycles. Sorry, that's 1,000 kilocycles. But as the frequency becomes higher, the benefits disappear. This is because irregularities of stranding and capacitance between the strands cause a failure to realize the ideal condition at very high frequencies. Condensers and dielectrics. A condenser is formed whenever an insulator, that is, a dielectric, separates two conductors between which a difference of potential can exist. The, si the size or capacitance of a condenser is expressed in farads, which is such a capacitance that when one volt 
is applied, the charge that is stored in the condenser is 1 coulomb. Uh, the farad is a very large unit and is frequently subdivided into the microfarad and micro-microfarad. Okay, well this is really old, isn't it? Because of course these days we don't call them a condenser, we call them a capacitor. Um, yeah, I'm going to take a quick break, I'll be back. I'm back. Got myself a coffee. You ought to keep your electronics nerds caffeinated, am I right? Ah, that's good stuff. Yeah, so uh, they're talking about condensers, and of course these days a condenser, we call it a capacitor. We still call the dielectric a dielectric though, which is, as it says here, an insulator. The dielectric is an insulator. And we've got a table here, characteristics of typical dielectrics at radio frequencies with normal room temperature. Uh, so uh, the... Um, uh, the, the, the dielectric constant for air is set at 1. <clears throat> I don't know what a power factor, I don't understand that. Uh, but it increases as the dielectric constant increases. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, right. So, uh, I'm not seeing anything that's uh, lower than air. Okay. So, mica, glass, bakelite. I don't even know what that... I don't even know how to pronounce that. I've seen it, though. They make switches out of it. As in mechanical switches that you switch, switch. <sighs> okay. Fascinating. So, different material has a different dielectric constant. Absolutely amazing uh, and of course um, uh, we still use the farad uh, at, uh, for, for um, the, uh, the this charge that is stored in the condenser is one coulomb uh, so yeah so the, the farad is a very large unit so they talk about the microfarad or the micro microfarad so presumably the microfarad and perhaps what they're calling the micro microfarad that's probably the pico farad because in the middle of that will be uh oh i'm not really sure not real sure uh, and it kind of doesn't matter, but all, all we need to take away from this is that the the um, the, the notation and and the uh, the vocabulary uh, changed a bit, but it's still farads. Uh, it's just that we've got microfarads, nanofarads, and picofarads is what we talk about now. Uh, and F, we wouldn't say F. Uh, A capital F for Farad. Although I don't think that... Yeah, I'm not real sure. I think Farad's is capital F. Anyway. Uh, on we go. On we go. So here's a, a picture. It's the representation of imperfect condenser by a perfect condenser of the same capacitance. <coughs> Uh, with series resistance and by a perfect condenser with shunt resistance. I see. So they're, they're just showing how uh, a, a perfect uh, capacitor uh, actually has some parasitic resistances in series and in parallel. Uh, and I think that they, they call parallel its shunt. I believe that's the right way. Yeah, so the shunt resistance. I, I think the word shunt is still used, but uh, we'd probably say parallel these days. But uh, yeah, I'm not an expert. Okay, and here's how, um, uh, how the dielectric constant and the frequency uh, 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 changes with temperature and frequency and the power factor also affected by temperature. So, um, okay, there you go. So we've got equivalent networks here with an inductance, a resistance uh, uh, in series and, uh, and, a, and a resistance in parallel. 
<clears throat> and at high, at low frequencies, uh, there you go. The 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 uh, series resistance and the series inductance aren't relevant. Um, Okay, equivalent electrical circuit of a variable air condenser. Okay, so we'd probably call that a tuning capacitor these days. Condensers with air dielectrics. Air dielectric finds its principal use in variable condensers for tuning resonant circuits. Although air is a perfect dielectric with zero power factor, air condensers have losses because of the insulators used to mount the two sets of plates with respect to each other and also because of the skin effect resistance of the leads, plates, rods and washers through which the current flows. An air dielectric condenser can be represented by the equivalent electrical network of figure 210A. Here C is the capacitance of the condenser while R2 is the equivalent shunt resistance introduced by the presence of the solid dielectric. This resistance is independent of the capacitance setting of the condenser which affects only the air dielectric portion of the condenser but is inversely proportional to the frequency. The condenser inductance L in figure 210A takes into account the magnetic effect of the current in the condenser and is to a first approximation independent of the capacitance setting and of the frequency. It depends primarily upon the physical size of the condenser and upon the method of making connections to the two sets of plates and is proportional to the physical side of, size of the condenser. The, resist the resistance R represents the series resistance of the leads, washers, connecting rods, etc. It is substantially independent of the capacitance setting but increases with frequency as a result of skin effect and is proportional to the square root of the frequency at high frequencies. Uh, at low and moderate frequencies, the effects of the inductance L and the series resistance R are negligible and the condenser equivalent circuit reduces to that shown in figure 210B where the resistance R2 is independent of the capacitance setting but varies inversely with the frequency. The power factor of the condenser under these conditions is independent of frequency but increases as the capacitance setting is decreased. See curve for one kilo cycle in figure 211. At very high frequency, this is uh, capacitance uh, and power factor. Okay. At very high frequencies, however, the resistance, the series resistance R, can no longer be neglected. As a consequence, the, fa the power factor for a given capacitance setting rises at very high frequencies. Furthermore, the rise above. <coughs> Uh, the low or moderate frequency value is more pronounced the greater the capacitance setting. This is illustrated in figure 211. Also at very high frequencies the reactance of the series inductance L is not negligible compared with the reactance of the condenser capacitance. This causes the apparent capacitance of the condenser as observed at the terminals to be greater than the actual capacitance according to the relation. Apparent capacitance is C over 1 minus omega squared LC where omega is 2 pi times frequency and L and C are as shown in figure 210. Condensers with solid dielectrics. Solid dielectrics are used in most fixed and in some adjustable condensers. The dielectric most commonly employed include mica, paper, plastic films and ceramics. Mica is characterized by low electrical losses, stability, high leakage resistance to DC voltage <coughs> and by high voltage strength. It is, however, relatively expensive. Micro condensers find their chief use in small fixed condensers for bypassing radio frequency currents or blocking off DC voltages and in resonant circuits or in filters where a stable low power factor condenser is required. Paper condensers normally consist of two strips of aluminium foil insulated by paper and rolled into a bundle which is then vacuum treated, impregnated with oil or wax and sealed <coughs> against moisture. Paper condensers are inexpensive in proportion to capacitance and are relatively compact in proportion to voltage rating. <sighs> 
Such condensers are used primarily for bypass and blocking purposes. The power factor of such condensers is of the order of 0.5% and the leakage current when subjected to direct voltages is somewhat greater than that of micro condensers but is not large. The, inexpective, the inexpensive type of paper condenser that is sealed in wax cardboard containers deteriorates with time as a result of gradual penetration of moisture and so does not have unlimited life there you go and then they go on to talk about other types of capacitors you can imagine that this technology has changed a lot since back then uh, we still had problems with capacitors being unreliable though they, they, uh, they wear out and you need to replace them and there was a bad batch there in the in the early noughties I think it was yeah create a bit of a global problem <clears throat> so coils for resonance circuits coil resistance over equivalent series resistance for the Q factor I think the Q factor is Q for quality Q factor we still use Q factor today uh-huh and there we go values of circuit Q for single layer coils designed for different frequency ranges as reported by various investigators all these data were measured on the assumption that the tuning condenser has zero losses uh, that is that the condenser losses are charged against the coil hmm. yeah, shielding of magnetic and electrostatic fields okay there you go Figure 216, paths of electrostatic and magnetic flux lines about the same coil with and without magnetic and non-magnetic shields. Isn't that fascinating? So you've got magnetic flux with no shield and you've got electrostatic flux <coughs> with no shield. And then you've got magnetic flux and non-magnetic shield and electrostatic flux with conducting shield and then you've got magnetic flux with a magnetic shield wow okay I didn't even know you could have a magnetic shield I don't know how those work fascinating so much to learn Alright, now we're up to chapter 3, which is the properties of circuits with lumped constants. Series resonance. <coughs> Figure 3.1. Magnitude and phase angle of current in a series resonant circuit as a function of frequency for constant applied voltage and different circuit cues. When a constant voltage of varying frequency is applied to a circuit consisting of an inductance, capacitance and resistance all in series, the current that flows depends upon frequency in the manner shown in figure 3.1. At low frequencies, the capacitive reactance of the circuit is large and the inductive reactance is small so that most of the voltage drop is across the condenser while the current is small and leads the applied voltage by 90 degrees. At high frequency and the, the inductive reactance is large and the capacitive reactance low resulting in a small current that lags nearly 90 degrees behind the applied voltage and most of the voltage drop is across the inductance. In between these two extremes there is a frequency called the resonant frequency at which the capacitive and inductive reactances are exactly equal and consequently neutralize each other leaving only the resistance of the circuit to oppose the flow of current. The current at resonant frequency is accordingly equal to the applied voltage divided by the circuit resistance and is very large if the resistance is low. The characteristics of a series resonant circuit depend primarily upon the ratio of inductive reaction, uh, reactance, which is omega L, to circuit resistance R. That is, 
upon omega L on R. This rate ratio is frequently denoted by the symbol Q and is called circuit Q. Most of the loss in the usual resonance circuit is due to coil resistance because the losses in a properly constructed condenser are small in comparison with those of the coil. The result is that the circuit Q can ordinarily be taken as the Q of the coil alone, which was discussed in section 2.6. The general effect of different circuit resistances that is, different values of Q, is shown in figure 3, 1. Is this, no, that's figure 3. Oh, we must have already seen it. Uh, it is seen that when the frequency differs appreciably from the resonant frequency, the actual current is practically independent of the circuit resistance and it is very nearly the current that would be obtained with no losses. On the other hand, the current at the resonant frequency is determined solely by the resistance. The effect of increasing the resistance of a series circuit is, accordingly, to flatten the resonance curve by reducing the current at resonance. This broadens to the top of the curve giving a more nearly uniform current over a band of frequencies near the resonant point, but does so by reducing the selectivity of the tuned circuit, that is, the ability to discriminate between voltages of different frequencies. Analysis of series resonant circuit. The elementary voltage, current, and impedance relations of series resonant circuits are discussed in every book on alternating currents. The basic quantitative relations are listed below for convenient reference. There we go. So we've got resonant frequency, we've got ZS, we've got absolute ZS, we've got 10 theta, and we've got 1, oh there, okay. E is voltage applied, I is current flowing, F is frequency in cycles, omega is 2 pi F, uh, Q is omega L on R, and R is effective series resistance. All right. We've got more maths. Parallel resonance. A parallel circuit consisting of an inductance branch in parallel with a capacitive branch offers an impedance of the character shown in figure 3.3. This is figure 3.3. Magnitude and phase angle of impedance of a parallel circuit as a function of frequency for different circuit cues. Hmm. At very low frequency, the inductive branch draws a large lagging current while the leading current of the capacitive branch is small, resulting in a large lagging time current and a low lagging circuit impedance. At high frequencies, the inductance has a high reactance compared with the capacitance resulting in a large leading time current and a correspondingly low circuit impedance that is leading in phase. In between these two extremes there is a frequency at which the lagging current taken by the inductive branch and the leading current entering the capacitance branch are equal. Being 180 degrees out of phase, they neutralize, leaving only a small resonant in-phase current flowing in the line. The impedance of the parallel circuit then will then be a very high resistance, as is brought out in figure 3.3. The effect of circuit resistance upon the impedance of the parallel resonant circuit is very similar to the influence that resistance has upon the current flowing in series resonant circuit, as is evident when figures 3.1 and 3.3 are compared. Increasing the resistance of a parallel circuit lowers and flattens the peak of the impedance curve without appreciably altering the sides, which are relatively independent of the circuit resistance. The resonant frequency of a parallel circuit can be taken as the same frequency at which the same circuit is in series resonance. That is, the resonant frequency F0 is 1 on 2 pi times the square root of LC. And on we go. We've got more mathematics. <sighs> Talking about... Uh, uh, universal resonance curve of parallel circuit and calculation of parallel impedance. Okay. Consequently, the universal resonance curve and the working rules that were applied for estimating the sharpness of resonance of the series circuit also apply to the case of parallel resonance. Parallel circuits with low Q 
parallel resonance effects in inductive coils. Figure 3.6, representation of parallel impedance in terms of equivalent series resistance and reactance components together with universal curve giving these components as a function of frequency in a parallel constant circuit having a relatively high Q. Okay, we've got some rules. Rule 1. As far as the primary circuit is concerned, the effect that the presence of the coupled secondary circuit has is exactly as though an impedance had been added in series with the primary, where N is the mutual inductance, omega is 2 pi f, and Zs is the series impedance of secondary circuit when considered by itself. Rule 2. The voltage induced in the secondary circuit by a primary current of IP has a magnitude of omega MIP and lags the current that produces it by 90 degrees. In complex quantity notation, the induced voltage is minus J omega MIP. Rule 3. The secondary current is exactly the same current that would flow if the induced voltage were applied in series with the secondary and if the primary were absent. There you go. There's your three rules. And we go on to talk about the action of the coupled impedance. Inductively coupled circuit as a transformer. The inductively coupled circuit is a transformer in which the primary and secondary inductances represent the primary and secondary wirings of the transformer. The theory of the inductively coupled circuit that has been given is the general theory of transformers applicable to all circumstances. The commonly used method of analyzing the power transformer involving the concept of leakage inductances and turn ratio is a special case of the general theory which is convenient when the coefficient of coupling K approaches unity as is the case when closed magnetic cores are used. A coupled circuit may always be expressed in terms of leakage and coupled inductances and for purposes of analysis it is sometimes convenient to do so. This leads to the equivalent transformer circuit of figure 3.8b. Okay, you got a transformer in the middle there with uh, some uh, leakage inductance. There you go. Uh, where the total primary inductance is broken up into a leakage inductance L prime and a coupled leakage inductance L prime C, uh, while the secondary is likewise broken up into leakage inductance L double prime and a coupled inductance L double prime C. Each leakage inductance is considered as having no coupling whatsoever to the other winding, while the coupled inductances else L prime C and L prime prime C are taken as having a coefficient of coupling equal to unity. The values of these inductance components in terms of the coefficient of coupling and the primary, secondary, and mutual inductances are given in the figure. In the representation of 38B, turn ratio has no general significance since when the coefficient of coupling is low, the voltage induced in the secondary winding may be much smaller than the voltage applied to the primary terminals, even when the secondary winding has many more turns than does the primary. This arises from the fact that when the coefficient of coupling is low as for example 0.01 then the primary and secondary inductors are practically entirely leakage inductances. Analysis of some typical inductively coupled circuits. A coupled circuit with an untuned secondary consisting of a resistance and inductance. Coupled circuits with untuned primary and tuned secondary. Two resonant circuits tuned to the same frequency and coupled together. Yeah, radio. There's a reason why I'm a digital guy. <laughs> oh, look at this. We're getting pretty serious with the mathematics here. We got EC, voltage across the secondary condenser. E, the voltage applied in series with primary. 
k, actual coefficient of coupling, kc, critical coefficient of coupling, qp, q of primary circuit, qs, q of secondary circuit, and uh, what is this guy? I should know. I'm not sure. I forget what that is. Uh, actual frequency and resonant frequency. I'm just going to look that up because I'm annoyed I can't think. It's a lowercase gamma. That's a lowercase gamma. So gamma is the actual frequency divided by the resonant frequency. <clears throat> At residence, the series impedances of the primary and secondary circuits are resistances, and the response in the secondary is given by the relation given in 330. And then we go on with more mathematics and equations. Get to figure out some maximum possible things. There we go. So uh, frequency and relative voltage across secondary condenser. Okay. Two resonant circuits capaci capacitively coupled. Hmm. Capacitively coupled. Hmm. All right. Bandpass filters. Examination of figure 310 shows that it is possible by suitably, suitably coupling together two circuits tuned to the same frequency to obtain a curve of secondary current which is substantially constant over a limited range of frequencies around resonance and which then falls off rapidly at frequency farther off resonance. <sighs> when this result is obtained, one is said to have a bandpass filter. Such bandpass characteristics are particularly desirable in handling modulated waves because the response is practically the same uh, <clears throat> to the sideband frequencies uh, contained in the wave as to the carrier. In contrast with this, ordinary resonant circuits have a rounded top and so discriminate against the higher sideband frequency in favor of the lower sideband frequencies and carrier. The best band pass characteristic is obtained when the coefficient of coupling ranges from the minimum value that satisfies equation 333, corresponding to conditions where double peaks just fail to occur, to values about 50% greater where the curve of secondary circuit response curve shows moderate double peaks. The range of frequencies over which the secondary response then does not fall to less than 0.707 of the maximum value, that is the pass band, is equal to or slightly more than KFO where K is the actual coefficient of coupling used and FO is the center frequency of the bandpass characteristic. In designing a bandpass filter, the procedure is to select the coefficient of coupling required to give the desired bandwidth and then to adjust the circuit Q so that the central co uh, the critical coefficient of coupling has the desired relation to the coupling being used, equation 333 as a guide. For QP equals QS, this corresponds to circuit Qs in the range 1 on K to 1.5 on K. If the circuit Qs are higher than they should be for the bandwidth, then the double peaks become excessively pronounced. If the circuit Qs are lower than the proper value, then the curve of secondary response will have a top that is unnecessarily rounded instead of being substantially flat. These effects are shown in figure 313. Where is figure 313? Oh, we've already passed it. Are we going to go back to have a look at it? 313, where was that? Oh, here I see. Oh, there you go. So they were talking about those peaks. They, they can get silly or they can get flat. And then there's sort of in the middle there. There you go. Alternative methods... <coughs> Alternative methods of obtaining bandpass characteristics. What are those? 
Bandpass effects can also be obtained when similar primary and secondary circuits are tuned to slightly different resonant frequencies. The shape of the response curve obtained in this way is substantially identical with that obtained with similarly tuned circuits, provided the amount of the detuning and the coefficient of coupling are so related that the quantity square root of k squared plus delta divided by f0 on square squared as defined above <laughs> is equal to the effective coefficient of coupling called for by the bandpass design. The circuit cues are the same as those called for when the circuits are tuned to the same frequency and the general behavior is as though the bandpass effect was developed without detuning. Bandpass circuits with parallel feed, bandpass circuits with shunt resistance loading. Uh, Thevenin's theorem. I should really look up how to pronounce that. I've seen it a few times. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what that little squiggle on top of the E is called and I don't know how you pronounce it. So I want to tell me that'd be great. Uh, according to Thevenin's theorem, any linear network containing one or more sources of voltage and having two terminals behaves insofar as a load impedance connected across these terminals is concerned as though the network and its generators were equivalent to a single simple generator having an internal impedance Z and a generated voltage E where E is the voltage that appears across the terminals when no load impedance is connected and Z is the impedance that is measured between the terminals when all sources of voltage in the network are short circuited. This theorem means that any network and its generators represented schematically by the block in figure 318a can be replaced by the equivalent circuit shown in figure 318b. The only limitation to the validity of Thevenin's theorem encountered in ordinary practice is that the circuit elements of the network must be linear. That is, the voltage developed must always be proportional to the current network with generators, actual arrangement, equivalent arrangement. There you go. A schematic diagram illustrating how Thevenin's theorem can be used to simplify a complicated network containing generators. Thevenin's theorem offers a very powerful means of simplifying networks, particularly when a load impedance is connected across the output terminals of a complicated network. Two examples will be used to illustrate this. First, consider the circuit of figure 39, which is redrawn in figure 319a. If one takes, that's here, so we've got an actual circuit with the inductances, and resistances and a capacitor and a voltage source. Okay. Uh, if one takes the secondary condenser C2 as the load impedance and applies Thevenin's theorem to the network to the left of C2, the result is figure 319B in which the equivalent generator voltage is the voltage induced by the secondary inductance L2 when the secondary is open circuit and the equivalent generator impedance consists of the inductance L2 and the resistance R2 in series with the impedance which is coupled to L2 by a secondary circuit consisting of L1 shunted by the resistance R1. The coupled impedance produced by such a secondary circuit has been previously considered and is equivalent to adding capacitive reactance and resistance in series. The resistance causes the effective Q of the secondary response curve to be reduced, while the series capacitance <coughs> sorry, while, while the series capacitive reactance tends to raise the apparent resonant frequency by an amount that becomes greater the higher the ratio of omega L1 on R1. This accounts for the behavior of the curves in figure 3.9. The second example is furnished by figure 3.16a. This circuit may be simplified by considering that blah, blah, blah. Okay, impedance matching. 
A load connected across the output terminals of a network, such as represented schematically by figure 13a, can be matched to the source of power in either of two ways. When the load impedance has the same magnitude and phase angle as the equivalent generator impedance Z defined by Thevenin's theorem, see figure 318b, the load is said to be matched to the generator or source of power on an image impedance basis. The term image arises from the fact that the impedances on the two sides of the output terminals are image, images of each other. When the load impedance is not identical with the generator impedance that it is desired to obtain impedance matching on an image basis, it is then necessary to transform the load to the correct impedance to match the generator. This transformation can be accomplished with the aid of an appropriate network of reactances or in simple cases by means of a transformer. Alternatively, a load impedance may be matched to a source of power in such a way as to make the power delivered to the load a maximum. This is accomplished by making the load impedance the conjugate of the generator impedance as defined by Thevenin's theorem. That is, the load impedance must have the same magnitude as the generator impedance, but the phase angle of the load is the negative of the phase angle of the generator impedance. This method of matching is shown, in sch sh shown schematically in figure 320. It will be noted that the reactive component of the load is then in resonance with the reactive component of the generator impedance. That is, the load reactance is the correct value to tune out the generator reactance. The resistance components of the load and generator impedance are then matched on an image impedance basis. Such impedance matching to obtain maximum power delivered to the load is a common operation in communication circuits and is carried out by transforming the equivalent series resistance of the load to a value equal to the resistance component of the generator by the use of suitable networks and transformers and then adding reactances to the load as required to resonate with the generator reactance. There you go. So 320 is the load impedance match to generator in such a way as to give maximum power in the load. Okay. It will be noted that when the generator impedance is resistive, the conditions corresponding to matching on an image impedance basis are identical with those corresponding to matching on the basis for maximum power output delivered to the load. Otherwise, the two conditions are not the same and matching on an image impedance basis then does not result in maximum power uh, being delivered to the load, although it is often still used to maintain appropriate impedance relations in a network. Okay, chapter four, circuits with distributed constants. Fundamental relations in transmission lines. Transmission lines find many uses in radio work. They are employed to transmit energy, act as resonant circuits at high frequencies, are employed as a measuring device at high frequencies, and are used as aids to obtain impedance matching, etc. Differential equations of the transmission line. Considering a very short section, DL, of a transmission line, as in figure 4.1, there is a small change, DE, in voltage across the section that results from the line current I flowing through the resistance RDL and reactance J omega LDL of the section DL. Likewise, the current changes a small amount, DI, as a result of the flow of current between the wires through the capacitance CDL and conductance GDL caused by the voltage that exists between these wires. Referring to figure 4.1, one can accordingly write the equations for DE and DI and then rearrange where E is the voltage and I is the current and blah, 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 blah. Not going to go through all of that. So we're learning about uh, the evaluation of boundary conditions in transmission line equations. Okay, and uh, on we go. Did I miss a page? No. All right, transmission line behavior in terms of incident and reflected waves. Okay. There's a lot of interesting stuff in here, but we don't have the time to cover it. Standing wave ratio. Load impedance, <coughs> a capacitive reactance.
effects of attenuation on voltage and current distribution ah. all right transmission line constants the electrical properties of a transmission line are determined by the resistance inductance conductance and capacitance per unit length of line and by the frequency. There you go. For a two wire line, for a concentric line, for a two wire line, for a concentric line. Okay, lots of maths there. Uh, impedance and power factor relations in transmission lines. Magnitude and power factor of line impedance with increasing distance from the load for the case of short circuited receiver with the line with moderate attenuation. Variation of sending N impedance of a short circuited transmission line of fixed length as the frequency is changed. Wow. Properties of transmission lines with zero losses. The behavior and of an idealized transmission line of zero loss is important because for many purposes and under many circumstances the results obtained under this simplifying approximation are sufficiently ac accurate for practical use. There you go, that's nice. Transmission line charts. The Smith chart. Wow. Coordinates are so chosen that load conditions corresponding to a given standing wave ratio lie on a circle having its origin at the center of the Smith chart. Effect of attenuation on voltage standing wave ratio. Transmission lines as resonant circuits and as circuit elements. Artificial lines. An artificial line is a four terminal network composed of resistance, inductance and capacitance elements. Insofar as the terminals are concerned, such a network can be considered as being the equivalent of some transmission line when symmetrical about the midpoint or a combination of a transmission line and a transformer when unsymmetrical. So we've got uh, phase retarded by a large angle, phase retarded by a small angle, phase advanced by a large angle, phase advanced by a small angle. Figure 415, a three element reactive network which may be used for impedance matching. Hey, that's cool. So you can retard the retard the phase by a lot, retard the phase by a bit, advance the phase by a large angle, or advance the phase by a small angle. And uh, okay, you can do it with two two capacitors and an inductor, or you can do it with two inductances and a capacitor, or two inductances and a capacitor and two capacitors and an inductor and then inductances isn't that isn't that cool wow l reactive networks an l network composed of reactive impedances is able to transform from one arbitrarily assigned characteristic impedance to a second characteristic impedance arbitrarily assigned however since the L network contains only two circuit elements, the phase shift beta introduced by the L section is determined by the ratio of these two impedances. The design equations of a reactive L network in terms of the characteristics impedances R1 and R2 at the two pairs of terminals are, assuming R1 is greater than R2, 
given by 46. One may employ either the two top signs or the two bottom signs. The phase constant beta corresponding to the characteristic impedance R1 and R2 is cos beta equals the square root of R2 on R1. The network configurations that result from the application of equation 446 are shown in figure 416. L sections composed of reactive elements that can be used for in pins matching between two resistances R1 and R2. The larger resistance is designated as R1. Use of transmission lines in impedance matching and as transformers. Uh -huh. Energy is transmitted most efficiently by a transmission line when no reflected wave trains are present. The load impedance will, however, only under exceptional cases, be a resistance that is exactly equal to the characteristic impedance of the line. Thus, to obtain transmission of energy with maximum efficiency, it is normally necessary to transform the load impedance that is actually present to a resistance equal to the characteristic impedance of the line. This is commonly accomplished with the aid of transmission lines or artificial transmission lines. Matching of resistive loads. The load impedance is frequently resistive or can be made resistive by tuning. One is then confronted with the problem of transforming the resistance actually present to a resistance equal to the characteristic impedance of the line. This impedance transformation can be carried out in a number of ways with the aid of transmission lines. One method particularly suitable for very high frequencies is to employ a tapered section of transmission line as discussed below in section 410. Another method is to employ an artificial transmission line composed of reactive elements as discussed in section 48, which is designed so that the pair of terminals associated with the load have a characteristic impedance equal to the load resistance, while the other pair of terminals have a characteristic impedance equal to the characteristic impedance of the line that is to be matched. This method of impedance matching illustrated in 417A is generally used. 417 is a schematic diagrams illustrating the matching of a resistive load to a transmission line by an impedance matching network and by a quarter wave matching section. I don't know what a quarter wave matching section is. It's, it's, uh, it's an impedance matching line. It's a so they just use a different type of conductor, I guess. I don't really know how that works. All right, impedance matching by means of a stub line. A general method of matching an impedance that is not purely resistive to the characteristic impedance of a transmission line consists in shunting the transmission line at an appropriate place with a stub line of appropriate length. Yeah, right. This is illustrated in 418. The stub is located at a point AA on the standing wave pattern of the unmatched line such that the conductance component G of the admittance Y of the unmatched line looking toward the load as calculated by equation 433 will equal the reciprocal of the characteristics impedance that is desired to present to the matched portion of the transmission line. Okay. Double stub impedance matching system. Double slug impedance transformer. This method, illustrated in figure 421, makes use of two slugs of dielectric material that are electrically a quarter of a wavelength long, taking <coughs> uh, into account the fact that the dielectric constant K reduces the distance representing a wavelength to a value of 1 on root K times that for air. The doubling slug tuner operates by introducing a reflected wave that is adjusted to produce a reflection equal in magnitude and opposite in phase to the reflected wave produced by the load impedance. The phase of the reflection introduced in this way is controlled by moving the slugs along the line while maintaining the spacing L2 between them constant. The magnitude of the reflected wave can be controlled with little effect on the phase by moving the two slugs among equal amounts in opposite directions. There we go. <sighs> Miscellaneous aspects of transmission lines. Uh, impedance measurements by means of transmission lines. Measurements. Okay. Directional couplers. 
The term directional coupler denotes a system of coupled lines such that the effects of incident and reflected waves in the primary line are separated in a secondary line. Directional coupler system employing two coupling holes spaced a quarter of a wavelength apart. Tapered lines. A tapered transmission line is a line in which the characteristic impedance varies gradually from one end to the other end. There you go. Higher order modes of in transmission lines. When the spacing between the two wires of a transmission line exceeds a half wavelength, or when the circumference of the outer conductor of the coax line exceeds a wavelength, the transmission line is capable of transmitting energy in a manner corresponding to a higher mode of operation. The first such higher mode is shown in figure 425, which is over the page. This can occur when the arithmetic mean circumference exceeds the wavelength in the cable, that is when B and A are the radii of the inner conductors respectively. Okay. Transmission line irregularities. An incident wave traveling from the generator towards the receiver that encounters an isolated discontinuity will be partly reflected by the irregularity so that a reflected wave originates at the irregularity and travels back toward the generator. Similarly, a wave reflected from a load impedance and traveling toward the generator that encounters an isolated irregularity will produce a reflected component that originates at the point of the irregularity and travel towards the receiver. Irregularities may be introduced in many ways. Typical causes are bends or turns, insulation supports, extra extraneous objects that affect the electrical magnetic field such as probes, dielectric or metal bodies, secondary coupled circuits and so on. A particular case of discontinuity that is of special importance is where the characteristic impedance changes abruptly as is the case in Uh, figure 427. It can be shown that the reflection produced by such a discontinuity is that corresponding to a load impedance consisting of the characteristic impedance of the line on the load side of the discontinuity shunted by an auxiliary capacitance that takes into account the distortion of the electric and magnetic fields in the immediate vicinity of the discontinuity. Waveguides. General considerations. The term waveguide denotes a hollow conducting tube used for the transmission of electromagnetic waves. At ultra high frequency waveguide wa at ultra high frequency waveguides provide a practical alternative to ordinary transmission lines. Many of the phenomena encountered in waveguides are similar to those of ordinary two-wire or coaxial transmission lines. In particular, the concepts of reflection from a load impedance or an irregularity, standing waves and impedance matching developed in connection with transmission lines can be applied directly to waveguide systems. At the same time, waveguides possess a number of properties that do not have counterparts in transmission lines. In particular, a waveguide act as a high pass filter. That is, it does not transmit waves having a frequency less than a critical or cutoff value determined by the guide dimensions. As a result, waveguides are of practical value only at the very highest frequencies. The configuration of fields within the waveguide must be a solution of Maxwell's equations that satisfies the boundary conditions and particularly that to the extent that the walls of the waveguide are perfect conductors, there is no tangential component of electric field at the walls of the waveguide. Many types of field configurations can be found that meet these requirements. A critical examination of the various field distributions that can exist in a waveguide reveals that they may be divided into two fundamental types. In the first type, the electric field lies in a plane at right angles to the axis of the guide and has no component anywhere in the direction of the axis, while the magnetic field at the same time has components in the direction of the axis as well as at right angles to the axis. These waves are termed transverse electric or TE waves, sometimes also called H waves. In the second type, the situation with respect to the field is reversed, where being 
there being no component of the magnetic field in the direction of the axis, while the electric field has components in this direction. These waves are termed transverse magnetic or TM waves, also sometimes called E waves. The different types of configuration under each class are designated by subscripts, as for example TE10 as explained below. Cool. Uh, rectangular waveguides. The most widely used type of waveguides wave has a rectangular cross section as illustrated in figure 428 and the preferred mode of operation is that which has the lowest cutoff frequency called the dominant mode. Dominant mode. The field configuration of the dominant mode is illustrated in 429. Uh, here the electric field is vertical with intensity maximum at the center of the guide and dropping off sinusoidally to zero intensity at the edges as shown. The magnetic field is in the form of loops which lie in planes that are at right angles to the electric field, that is, which are parallel to the top and bottom of the guide. The magnetic field distribution is the same for all planes perpendicular to the y-axis and the x-direction the intensity of the component of magnetic field that is transverse to the axis of the waveguide, that is the component in the direction x, is at any point in the waveguide directly proportional to the intensity of the electric field at that point. This entire configuration of fields travels in the direction of the waveguide axis in the z direction in figure 428 and at velocity corresponding to the velocity of phase propagation defined below. Yeah. I wonder how they make these things. Wavelength, group and phase velocity. The actual length lambda g corresponding to one cycle of variation in the field configuration is the axial direction, in the axial direction, is termed the guide wavelength. Its relation to the phase constant beta of equation 450b is the same as the relationship between the wavelength and phase constant in a transmission line. By combining equations 430, 450b and 451, one obtains the guide wavelength lambda g equals lambda over the square root of 1 minus lambda on lambda c squared where lambda is the actual wavelength in free space and lambda c is the wavelength that corresponds to cutoff. It will be noted that the guide wavelength also exceeds the wavelength in free space. <sighs> Higher modes. The dominant mode is the simplest and has the longest cutoff wavelength of an infinite series of possible field configurations that can be propagated down a rectangular wave guide. The next highest mode, shown in figure 432, include waves of the transverse magnetic type in which the magnetic flux lines lie in a plane at right angles to the axis of the guide. These various modes are designated by subscripts leading to designations such as TE10, TE20, TE11, TMN, TE11, alright. So we're just on with the theory of waveguides here. Physical picture of propagation in rectangular waveguide. Frequency greatly in excess of cutoff. Frequency moderately in excess of cutoff. Frequency close to cutoff. I see. Positive crest, negative crest. Yeah. Currents in waveguide walls. The fields inside a waveguide induce currents in its walls. These currents can be considered to be associated with the magnetic flux adjacent to the wall. The relationship between the flux density at the surface of the wall and the current flowing in the wall is given by equation 212. Uh, the direction in which... where is equation 212? Oh, that's ages ago. 
The direction in which the current flows at any point in the wall is at right angles to the direction of the magnetic flux adjacent to the wall. The lines of current flow in the walls of a rectangular guide for the dominant mode are accordingly as illustrated in figure 436. In the side walls, all of the current flows vertically since the magnetic flux in contact with the side walls is in planes parallel to the top and bottom sides of the guide. In the top and bottom part of the guide, there is a transverse component of current proportional to BZ and a longitudinal axial component proportional at any point to the transverse magnetic field BX. All right, a picture here. Paths of current flow in the walls of a rectangular waveguide when propagating the dominant mode. Attenuation in waveguides. The propagation of energy down a waveguide is accompanied by a certain amount of attenuation as the result of the energy dissipated by the current induced in the walls of the guide. <clears throat> the magnitude of this current at any point is determined by the intensity of the magnetic field adjacent to the wall at that point as explained above. The resistivity that the induced current currents encounter is determined by the skin effect of the wall in accordance with equation 213 and is proportional to the square root of the frequency and the square root of the resistivity of the material of which the wall is composed. The total energy loss in a waveguide can be calculated by summing up the total I squared R losses in the top, bottom and two sides of the guide over a length corresponding to a half wavelength for the distribution of magnetic field actually present as calculated in equation 450 or equivalent for some particular instant of time. The energy loss is conveniently expressed in decibels attenuation per unit length. The situation existing in a typical case is shown in figure 437. The attenuation is lower for the dominant mode than for the higher modes. Also for any mode there is a particular frequency for which the attenuation is minimum. This is the result of two opposing tendencies. As the frequency increases, the skin effect in the wall material increases, thereby tending to increase the losses. At the same time, increasing the frequency makes the field configuration more favorable for keeping the losses low. An exact, exact analysis of the situation in a rectangular waveguide with copper walls and air dielectric operating in the do dominant T E10 mode leads to the attenuation formula given in 464, where A and B are in inches and are as shown in figure 428. And lambda and lambda c are the free space wavelength and cutoff wavelength, respectively. When the walls of the waveguide are of other material than copper, the attenuation is proportional to the square root of the resistivity relative to copper. Circular waveguides. Okay, circular waveguides have a certain field of usefulness as where it is necessary to introduce a rotating joint into the waveguide system. In general, however, circular waveguides are avoided because there is only a very narrow range between the cutoff wavelength and the dominant mode and of the next higher order mode and because the circular symmetry of the guide does not require that the wave maintain its polarization the, <coughs> the same at all points in the guide. Field configurations for the more important modes are illustrated in figure 438. As with the rectangular guides, these modes may be classified as transverse electric, TE, or transverse magnetic, TM, according to whether it is the electric or magnetic lines of force that lie in planes perpendicular to the axis of the guide. The different modes are designated by subscripts, as in the case of rectangular guides. The first sub subscript, N, however, now denotes the number of distinct planes that may be passed through the axis of the guide and to which the electric vector is normal, except that for N equals zero, the electric lines are circular. Get your head around that. So uh, figure 438 is the field configuration of the dominant and first few higher order modes in a circular waveguide. Attenuation, figure, this is figure 439, attenuation of dominant and 
first higher order modes in a 2 inch copper cylindrical waveguide as a function of frequency. Standing waves, reflection, and impedance considerations in waveguides. Okay. Impedance matching in waveguides. Uh, you can taper the height of a waveguide. When a probe is exactly a quarter of a wavelength long, it becomes resonant and causes the guide to behave as though there was an open circuit at the point of the resonant probe. Probes longer than a quarter wavelength but less than three quarters of a wavelength long introduce inductive loading. The extent to which such a probe projects into the waveguide determines the magnitude of the compensating reflection while the position of the probe with respect to the standing wave pattern that is to be eliminated determines the phasing of the reflected wave. Figure 442, a tuning screw or a probe arranged to introduce a reflection adjustable in magnitude and phase. Wow. Inductive window, capacitive window, post inductive. Wow, series T and shunt T. This is amazing. Resonant obstacles in waveguides. Certain structures, when placed in a waveguide, produce resonant phenomena. For example, a quarter wave probe or a thin ring placed with its plane perpendicular to the axis of a circular waveguide, as illustrated in Figure 445A, acts as a sharply resonant circuit that provides almost complete reflection at the resonant frequency and relatively little for reflection at frequencies uh, differing considerably from resonance. On the other hand, an obstacle consisting of a metal plate closing the waveguide except for a slot, as illustrated in figure 445D and E, can be proportional to trans proportioned to transmit a particular frequency through the obstacle with no reflection while producing substantial reflections for higher and lower frequencies. Other examples of resonant windows are included in figure 445. There you go. Miscellaneous considerations and properties in waveguides. Waveguide behavior at wavelengths greater than cutoff. Okay. Uh, waveguide to coaxial line transformation. Waveguide directional couplers. Magic T. It's a magic T configuration. A typical magic T is illustrated in 450. Uh, in this arrangement, if the two side outlets C and D have the same length and are terminated identically, then power delivered to the system at A divides at the junction and flows equally to C and D with no output whatsoever being obtained at B. Ah. Similarly, power supplied at B divides between C and D and none of it appears at A. <laughs> On the other hand, if power is delivered to the system at A and the terminations at C and D are not identical, then there will be an output at B proportional to the difference between the waves reflected at C and D. This behavior can be explained as follows. Okay, <laughs> so uh, comparison of wave guides and coaxial transmission lines. Wave guides find their principal use in the transmission of power at wavelengths of the order of 10 centimeters or less under conditions where low attenuation or high power carrying capacity is important. The power losses in a waveguide will be of the order of one third as great as a comparable uh, coaxial line having air dielectric with supporting insulators 
and the superiority is many times greater as compared with the best flexible cable. The power carrying capacity of a waveguide as limited by flashover is likewise from 3 to 10 times as great as that of a standard coaxial line having air dielectric with supporting insulators and may be on the order of a thousand times as great as that of flexible cable with solid dielectric. A waveguide must have a size that is reason a reasonable fraction of a wavelength. Uh, this is an advantage at very short wavelengths, such as one centimeter, where coaxial lines with proportions that avoid higher modes are prohibitively small. However, at wavelength much greater than 10 centimeters, the waveguide becomes undesirably large and so then find use only in special applications. Other things being equal, waveguides also have the advantage in mechanical simplicity over coaxial lines with air insulation and dielectric support. Cavity resonators. Any space completely enclosed, enclosed with conducting walls can contain oscillating electromagnetic fields within it and possess certain resonant frequencies when excited by electrical oscillations. Resonators of this type, commonly termed cavity resonators, find extensive use as resonant circuits at extremely high frequencies. For such use, cavity resonators have the advantage of simplicity, a relatively large physical size compared with alternative methods of obtaining resonance, a remarkably high Q, and can, if desired, be arranged to develop an extremely high shunt impedance. Uh, cavity resistance find extensive use at wavelengths of the order of 10 centimeter and less. The simplest cavity resonators are sections of waveguides shorted at each end and lambda g on two wavelengths long where lambda g is the guide wavelength. This results in a resonant analogous to that of a half wavelength transmission line short circuited at the receiving end. Another obvious shape is a sphere given in figure 4051a. Uh, but in addition, any enclosed surface, irrespective of how irregular the outline, will form a cavity resonator. Also, certain types of resonance can exist in cavities that do not correspond to a possible mode of wavelength guide propagation. The most important example of this is shown in figure 451b, which is the fundamental mode of the cylindrical cavity. An important class of cavity resonators is found in surfaces of the reentrant type as illustrated in figures 451D to F. I see. <sighs> For figure 452, transition of a reentrant cavern cavity resonator of the concentric line type to a cavity resonator that is a cylinder showing the electric fields. Hmm. There is a close relationship between cavity resonators and resonant transmission lines. For example, the arrangement of figure 552A can be thought of as either a reentrant cavity resonator or as a coaxial transmission line short circuited at one end and in quarter wavelength resonance with the other end open except for a localized capacitance surface that closes the end of the line. <laughs> resonant frequency of cas cavity resonators okay shunt impedance of cavity resonators coupling to cavity resonators radiation from holes there you go chapter 5 fundamental properties of electron tubes Electron tubes. The term electron tubes refers to devices that utilize the flow of free electrons in a vacuum or a partial vacuum. Such tubes are used to generate the radio frequency power required by radio and radar transmissions to control the energy thus generated, to amplify weak radio frequency signals obtained by the receiver, to rectify or detect the signal, to amplify this rectified signal, and so on. The electron tube has made possible the long distance telephone, uh, taking pictures, oh sorry, talking pictures, public address systems, television, etc talking pictures. Together it may 
be said that the electron tube is one of the most important devices that has resulted from modern science. Okay, wait until you meet the transistor, buddy. There are many forms of electron tubes in use and more are invented each year. In addition to the diode, triode, pentode, etc., tubes of ordinary radio, there have been developed in recent years other types of tubes such as the velocity modulation tube, the klystron, and the magnetron for generating, amplifying, and controlling alternating current energy of extremely high frequencies. There is then the cathode ray tube in which a beam of electrons is used to generate light, thereby producing a visual result from an electrical source, and the photoelectric tube in which light is used to produce an electrical effect. Finally, a small trace of gas is sometimes intentionally introduced into the vacuum tube to modify the characteristics in useful ways, one example being the thyrotron. Electrons, ions, and their motions. Okay. Motions of electrons and ions in an electrostatic field. The effect of a magnetic field on a moving electron. Thermionic emission of electrons. Oxide coated emitters. Velocity of emission. The electrons emitted from a hot cathode come out with a velocity that represents the difference between the kinetic energy possessed by the electron just before emission and the energy that must be given up to escape. Since the energy of the different electrons within the emitter is not the same, the velocity of emission will be different for different electrons and will commonly range from zero up to over one volt. Experiment shows that the velocity of emissions are distributed very nearly according to Maxwell's law for the distribution of velocities in a gas composed of electrons and having the temperature of the emitting cathode. The average velocity of emission accordingly increases with the cathode temperature just as does the average velocity of gas molecules. Secondary emission. Anode current when limited by space charge. Practical diodes. Diode tubes of the high vacuum type, such as discussed above, are available in sizes ranging from the small diodes that are used as detectors in radio receivers, handling anode currents of only a few milliamps, up to diodes suitable for developing by rectification, the anode power required in radio receivers, public address amplifiers, etc. High vacuum diodes were once used as rectifiers for developing the plate power required by large radio transmitters, but the hot cathode mercury vapor rectifier tube, C section 518, has largely taken over such applications. Triodes, action of the control grid. We'll continue with this in just a minute. We're going to take a break. Back. Now, uh, <coughs> I guess that uh, a diode used to be a tube. And they just kept the name when they started making them out of uh, germanium and, and, uh, and silicon and such. Because <sighs> it does say electron tubes, doesn't it? I'll have to look that up. I'll tell you about the diode and the etymology of it because it seems to have been predated by an electron tube. <sighs> Triodes, action of the control grid. Okay, Char characteristic curves of the triode. Current grid or grid current, grid current. Practical triode tubes. Commercially produced triode tubes are available from sub-miniature types up to tubes capable of developing several hundred kilowatts of output. The smaller types, such as used in radio receivers, public address systems, etc., are air-cooled, employ either glass, glass or metal envelopes, 
and use oxide coated cathodes. Both heater and filament types are available. Larger tubes capable of dissipating anode powers up to about one kilowatt usually have glass envelopes and employ either oxide coated or thoriated filament emitters. Still larger tubes use tungsten filament emitters and have copper anodes which serve as part of the envelope to permit cooling of the anode by water or forced air draft. And we've got some typical small vacuum tubes. Just looking at the specs of different types of tubes. Coefficients of triode tubes. Uh, dynamic plate resistance and is not equal to the ratio of total plate voltage to total plate current. Okay, dynamic plate resistance. Uh, transconductance or mutual conductance. Pentodes. A pentode is a five electrode tube consisting of cathode, plate and three grids which are concentrically arranged between cathode and plate as in figure 512. The inner grid is called the control grid and corresponds to the grid of a triode tube. The next grid is termed the screen or screen grid while the outer grid is called the suppressor. In normal operation the control grid is very commonly maintained negative with respect to the cathode. The screen grid is operated at a fixed positive potential while the suppressor is normally connected directly to the cathode. The plate is operated at a positive potential. The additional grids operated in this way modify the voltage and current relations within the tube in a way that is desirable for many purposes. The extra grids also provide electrostatic shielding between the anode plate and the control grid thereby eliminating electrostatic coupling between electrical circuits associated with the control grid and circuits associated with the anode. This shielding is particularly important in the case of radio frequency amplifiers. Pentone tubes intended for su such service will give practically perfect shielding when arranged as illustrated in figure 512. Voltage and current relations in pentode <laughs> Oh dear me. Voltage and current relations in pentode tubes. Okay. Characteristic curves of pentodes. Plate voltage and plate current. Screen grid current and plate voltage. Variable Mu tubes. Most of the small pentode tubes used in radio receivers are so designed as to cause the total space current and hence the plate current of the tube to tail off very negative control grid potentials rather than to have a sharply defined cutoff point. Practical pentodes. Commercial pento tubes are available from sub-miniature types up to tubes capable of developing one or two kilowatts of output. Screen grid tetrode tubes. The screen grid tube is a four electrode tetrode tube which can be thought of as a pentode with the suppressor grid removed. Voltage and current relations in screen grid tubes. Practical screen grid tubes. Historically, screen grid tubes came under the triode tube came after the triode tube was developed and before practical pento tubes were available. Screen grid tubes have at present limited practical application. However, because of the undesirable effects that result from the interchange of secondary electrons between plate and screen, and in particular because the plate current of the screen grid tube is so greatly affected by the re relative potentials of screen and plate, Screen grid tubes are found in practical use only in the form of relatively high power tetrodes where physical limitations make it impossible to employ the principles of the beam tube. Beam tubes. 
The beam tube is a tetrode that can be considered to be a special type of screen grid tube in which the design has been so modified that the action of a suppressor grid is obtained by accentuating the space charge effects of the electrons in transit in the space between the screen and the plate. Space charge effects in screen plate space. Constructional features of a beam power tube. Okay. Types of potential distribution encountered in screen plate region of the beam tube showing conditions existing for several values of anode voltage in each case. Hmm. Hi. Coefficients of pentone screen grid and beam tubes. Mu factor the amplification factor of pentode beam and screen grid tubes. The mu factor. Dynamic resistance. The dynamic resistance of an electrode is the resistance that it offers to a small increment in implied, applied voltage and corresponds to the plate resistance of the triode tube. In the case of pentode, beam and screen grid tubes, the resistance of the plate and screen circuits are of importance. They can be defined as follows. There we go. Transconductance. The transconductance can be defined in the general case as a charge change of current at electrode 2 as a result of voltage increment applied at electrode 1. So the transconductance is the change in I2 divided by the change in E1. Ah. In the case of pentodes and similar tubes, one is primarily interested in the transconductance from control grid voltage to plate current, and occasionally in the transconductance from control grid voltage to screen current. The former corresponds to the transconductance of a triode and has about the same numerical value as the corresponding triode. Mathematical representation of characteristic curves of tubes. Power law method of expressing tube characteristics. Power series method of representing characteristic curves of tubes. Uh, conventional high vacuum tubes, miscellaneous. Effect of residual gas on characteristics of high vacuum tubes, maximum allowable resistance in grid circuits. Okay, space charge grid tubes. High frequency and transit time effects in diode, triode, and pentode tubes. Lead inductance and electrode capacitance. Electrode currents resulting from electron motion. Oh wow, ultra high frequency behavior of diodes, small signal case. This case is illustrated in figure 334A. This is 34A where the voltage applied to the diode consists of a DC potential upon which is superimposed a much smaller radio frequency voltage. The situation of practical importance is when a full space charge exists. Insofar as the alternating voltage applied to the diode is concerned, the diode can be considered as consisting of a resistance or conductance uh, shunted by a capacitance as shown in figure 534B. Okay. At low frequencies, the diode resistance equals the dynamic anode resistance as defined according to equation 519A. However, as the frequency increases, the transit time causes a phase shift between the alternating component of the anode current and that of the anode voltage. The resulting behavior is shown in figure 534C, where the transit time is expressed as the time measured in radians at the applied frequency required for the electron to travel from cathode to anode. It will be noted that the equivalent plate conductance of the tubes decreases with increasing transit time becoming zero, infinite plate resistance at a transition time of one cycle or two pi radians, and then oscillates alternately between negative and positive values. Ah. <sighs> Transit time effects in diodes, large signal condition. Okay. Uh, transit time effects in triode and pentode tubes. Scaling in ultra high frequency tubes. 
Electron optics, electrostatic lenses. Use of electrostatic field to focus electron beams. That's what they do in a cathode ray tube, I believe. There's two ways you can do it. You do electrostatic and the other one's magnetic. Uh, figure 540. Electron paths in triode and beam tubes under typical conditions showing focusing action produced on electron paths by the grids. All right. Analogies with physical optics. Okay. Uh, quantitative relations in electron lenses. Characteristics of specific lenses. Aberrations. Electron lenses suffer from the same types of distortions that occur in the lenses of physical optics. Magnetic lenses. Magnetic fields can be used instead of electrostatic fields for focusing electrons, as I mentioned. I think you can use both. You can you can use one or the other in a, in a cathode ray tube. Or both, I think, even. Uh, but don't quote me. Uh, the electrons follow the lines of magnetic flux. Cathode ray tubes. The cathode ray tube provides a visual representation of electrical effects. Its usefulness arises from the fact that it does so directly and with a speed limited only by electron inertia. Cathode ray tubes consist of three fundamental components. An arrangement for producing an electron beam, turn the electron gun, two a means for deflecting this beam either electrostatically or magnetically in accordance with the phenomena to be displayed, and three a fluorescent screen upon which the electron beam is focused to form a fine spot and which gives forth light when bombarded by electrons. Then we talk about the electron gun and then we'll talk about deflection systems and then we'll probably say something about cathode ray screen and then we're up to transit time effects with electrostatic deflection. Okay, photography of cathode ray traces. In photographing cathode ray traces, it is desired to obtain a dense negative trace with high contrast. The photographic effect will naturally be greater as the beam power for a given spot is increased as this increases the brightness of the spot. The effectiveness will also depend upon the type of screen being, for example, much greater with the phosphor designated as P1 than for the phosphor P5 in photographic photographing recurrent traces. The exposure time is limited only by the fogging due to stray light and can be determined experimentally. Gas tubes. Okay. Uh, Grid-controlled gas triodes, the thyrotrons. And we've got cold cathode diodes, cold cathode triodes, microwave tubes, the klystrons, magnetrons, and traveling wave tubes. A number of methods have been developed for overcoming the transit time limitations of the ordinary high vacuum tube. Most important of these are the Klystron tube, which is useful as an oscillator and amplifier at microwave frequencies. The Magnetron tube, which is particularly suitable as a generator of extremely high frequency oscillations. And the Traveling Wave tube, which is unexcelled as a wideband amplifier at high frequencies. Vacuum tube amplifiers employing untuned load impedances. Vacuum tube amplifiers. Basic circuit of a vacuum tube amplifier. Okay. Cathode and grid return arrangements used with filament type tubes. Methods of classifying amplifiers. Amplifiers are classified in ways descriptive of their character and properties. The first classification is according to the frequencies to be amplified and leads to the four board divisions of audio frequency, radio frequency, video frequency, and 
<coughs> direct current amplifiers. Audio frequencies are frequencies that are audible to the ear. That is in the range of about 15 to approximately 15,000 cycles. Higher frequencies are considered to be radio frequencies. Video frequencies are those contained in television signals and range from the audio frequencies up to an upper limit of 5 million to 10 million cycles. Uh, amplifiers are also classified as to whether they are tuned or untuned. That is, whether they amplify a narrow band or a wide band of frequencies, respectively. In this connection, a band of frequencies is considered wide or narrow in proportion to the ratio of the width of the band to the frequency at its center. Thus, the group of frequencies lying between 1 and 5,000 cycles is a wide band, while the frequency band from uh, 1,100,000 to 1,500,000 cycles, which extends over the same frequency range, is narrow. Amplifiers can also be divided into voltage and power amplifiers according to whether the object is to produce as much voltage or as much power as possible in the load impedance. The reason that it is necessary to distinguish between these objectives can be understood by considering the problem of obtaining a large quantity of power from a single from a signal voltage that is so small as to require more amplification than can be obtained from a single tube. Under such circumstances, it is customary to use a number of amplifiers in cascade, each one of which amplifies the output of the preceding tube and delivers its output to another tube for additional amplification. In arranging such an amplifier, the best results are obtained by making all the amplifying tubes, except the last one, operate as voltage amplifiers, while the last tube functions as a power amplifier. The power tube then has the maximum possible signal voltage applied to its grid and is therefore able to deliver the greatest amount of power. There is no object <coughs> in making the other tubes function as power amplifiers since the purpose of these tubes is to increase the signal voltage delivered to the last tube, the power output of which represents the output of the amplifier. Amplifiers, particularly power amplifiers, are also designated as Class A, Class AB, Class B, Class C, or linear amplifiers according to the operating conditions. The term Class A is applied to an amplifier adjusted so that the plate current flows continuously throughout the cycle of the applied signal voltage. The subscript 1 is sometimes used to indicate that no grid current flows, while well, subscript 2 can be used to denote that the grid is driven positive at some part of the cycle of, of applied voltage. Thus, a class A2 amplifier is one in which grid current does flow. In the class B and linear amplifiers, the tube is biased approximately to cut off so that the plate current in an individual tube flows in pulses lasting approximately a half cycle, while the class C amplifier is adjusted so the plate current flows in pulses that last less than a half cycle. The class AB is intermediate between class A and class B adjustments. The linear amplifier and class B amplifier differ only in that the former employs a tuned load circuit. The type of amplifier is fixed primarily by the constants of the associated electrical circuits and by the grid bias and plate voltages employed. It is possible to make any particular tube function as any kind of amplifier, although the tube characteristics best suited for each type of amplifier are somewhat different. Distortion in amplifiers, delay time. An ideal amplifier produces an output it exactly <coughs> that exactly duplicates the input in all respect except magnitude. An actual amplifier can fall short of this ideal by failing to amplify the different frequency components of the input voltage equally well. 
by giving an output that is not exactly proportional to the amplitude of the input or by making the relative phase of the different frequency components in the output differ from the relative phase existing in the input. These effects are commonly referred to as frequency, amplitude or nonlinear and phase or time delay distortion respectively. respectively. So frequency, amplitude or nonlinear and phase or time delay distortion. Frequency distortion is caused by the circuits associated with the amplifier tube and limits the bandwidth of the amplifier. Amplitude distortion arises from nonlinear relations between voltage and current according, occurring in the amplifier tube and limits the amount of voltage or power output that an amplifier can develop. Amplitude or nonlinear distortion results in the production of frequencies in the amplifier output that are not present in the input voltage applied to the grid. The most important of these distortion frequencies are harmonics of the frequency contained in the input and the sum and difference frequencies formed by combinations of the signal, signal components. Phase shift between the output and input of an amplifier is related to the time of transmission through the amplifier in accordance with the relation. Phase shift lag in radians is omega r plus omega pi. Or is that omega tau? I think it is. Where t tau is called the delay time in seconds. Omega is 2 pi times the frequency. And n is an integer, which will be odd if the amplifier has an inherent tendency to reverse the phase of all components of the applied voltage. And will be even if there is no tendency for phase rever reversal. A value n equals 0 is considered as an even value. And on we go. In order to avoid phase distortion, tau must be the same for all frequencies. Equivalent circuit of the vacuum tube amplifier. The effect on the plate current of applying a signal voltage, e.g. to the grid, is exactly as though the plate cathode circuit of the tube were a generator developing a voltage. Uh, mu eg and having an internal resistance equal to the plate resistance of the tube. <sighs> resistance coupled amplifiers. In the resistance coupled amplifier, also sometimes called resistance capacitance coupling, the load impedance is a combination of resistance and capacitance as shown in figure 64a. Analysis of resistance coupled amplifier with screen and cathode bypassing fully effective. The extent to which the amplification falls off at high frequencies is, therefore, determined by the ratio that the reactance of the shunting capacitance C0 bears to the equivalent resistance obtained by combining the plate resistance, coupling resistance, and grid leak resistance in parallel. Get your head around that. Effect of incomplete bypassing of bias and screen impedances. For bypassing <coughs> in the screen circuit to be fully effective, that is for beta to approach unity, the bypass condenser CSG must have a reactance that is less than the equivalent resistance formed by the voltage dropping resistant RSG in parallel with the dynamic screen grid resistance RS. Oh boy. Circuit of a transformer coupled amplifier together with exact and approximate equivalent plate circuits. <sighs> transformer coupled amplifiers. Frequency, cycles per second, voltage, amplification. Figure 613, variation of amplification with frequency in a typical transformer coupled amplifier. Interesting. I'm going to take a quick break. On we go. 
So obviously uh, this is a trans transformer here and they're coupling the, the transformers, uh, so the amplifiers with a transformer. So this, that's what transformer coupling is all about. Uh, the response falls off to 70.7% of its mid-range uh, value U, mu n at the frequency for which the reactance of the primary inductance equals the effective plate resistance R prime P. Oh, dear me. Shunt, and here they they point out, shunt and parallel basically mean the same thing. So shunt feed with transformer coupling. Okay. It's pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. Miscellaneous considerations. Video frequency, wide band voltage amplifiers. An amplifier designed to amplify voltages up to frequencies of the order of megacycles is termed a video amplifier. The simplest method of obtaining such a wide response band is to employ an ordinary resistance couple amplifier and make the coupling resistance low enough to give the desired high frequency response. The result obtained in this way is satisfactory where the frequency and time delay distortion requirements are analogous to those of ordinary audio frequency amplifiers. High frequency compensation of video amplifiers. couple of charts here. Universal amplification curve giving characteristics obtained with varying amounts of shunt peaking. Response characteristics of multi-stage shunt peaking systems designed for Q2 equals 0.414 and Q2 equals 0.50 showing changes in the frequency response and reduction in bandwidth as the number of stages n is increased. You know, they did say about the quality of the paper in this book, and I don't know really what they mean, because it seems like pretty good quality paper to me. Low frequency compensation of video amplifiers. The factors that caused the amplification to fall off and shift in phase at low frequencies were discussed in section 6.3 and are the coupling condenser, the impedance in series with the screen circuit, and the bias impedance. Low frequency performance satisfactorily Low frequency performance satisfactory for many purposes can be obtained by ordinary design expedients, such as employing a large coupling condenser and bypassing the cathode and screen resistance with large condensers in television and similar applications. However, the requirements are so rigid as to require a special consideration. For example, at the frame frequency of 60 cycles used in the United States television system, the total amplification of a system involving 10 to 20 stages must be within about three decibels of the mid frequency value and the total phase shift at this frequency should not exceed about 20 degrees for high quality systems. Consider first the effects produced by the coupling condenser from the equivalent circuit of figure 64D and assuming that the coupling resistance is quite small compared with the plate resistance RP and grid leakage resistance RGL as is always permissible with wideband amplifiers, it follows that the phase shift equals that and falling off in gain at low frequency equals that. And on we go. So it's talking about video frequency stuff, which was megahertz, I believe. The effects produced upon a square wave by amplifier imperfections for idealized cases. There you go. Tubes for video voltage amplification. The merit of a tube as a video voltage amplifier using the shunt peaking coupling network is measured in terms of the amount of amplification that can be obtained over a given bandwidth. Reproduction of high frequency transients by video amplifiers. Amplitude distortion in amplifiers. Analysis based on graphical methods. Graphical analysis of distortion, dynamic characteristics, and load lines. Uh, 
dynamic characteristic for some situations except that grid bias at operating points is more negative dynamic characteristics for some situation except that grid bias at operating point is less than negative wow Distortion of the signal voltage resulting from grid current. Considerations limiting the amplitude that can be handled without distortion. Mathematical analysis of amplitude distortion and cross modulation in amplifiers. Applications of power series methods to the analysis of distortion in amplifiers. Summary of effects produced by different order components of the plate current. Experimental evaluation of second and third order coefficients. Resistance coupled and video amplifiers designed for large output stages. Oh, sorry, output voltages. Narrow band amplifiers. Wide band amplifiers. Class A power amplifiers. Selection of operating conditions for Class A power amplifiers tubes for class A power amplification output transformers in class A amplifiers analysis of the frequency response characteristics triode case Analysis of the frequent response characteristics, pentode and beam tube case. Hmm. Measurements of transformer characteristics. The essential characteristics of an output transformer are the primary inductance, the leakage inductance reduced to unity turn ratio, the turn ratio and the copper loss resistance is also reduced to unity turn ratio. In transformers to be used with pentode and beam tubes, the distributed capacitance of the primary winding or the frequency at which this capacitance is resonant with the leakage inductance may also be of importance. Transformers with shunt feed. The shunt feed, also called parallel feed arrangement illustrated in 638A, is often used in order to avoid passing the DC plate current through the primary winding of the transformer. This eliminates direct current saturation of the core, thereby increasing the incremental inductance of the primary. Power rating of output transformers. The maximum current that an output transformer can carry is determined by the heating of the windings while the maximum voltage that can be applied is limited by the permissible flux density in the core. These two factors operating together determine the power rating of the output transformer. If the alternating flux density in the core is high, the inductance varies during the cycle because of the nonlinear character of the magnetization curve. This limits the maximum permissible flux density. The relationship between the applied voltage and the flux density depends on the frequency and core cross-section according to the well-known equation uh, 4.44 FNBA times 10 to the minus 8 where N is the number of turns, F is the frequency, B is the flux density in the core in lines per unit area and A is net area of the core. Push-pull class A amplifiers. 
In the push-pull amplifier, two tubes are so arranged that their grids are excited with equal voltages 180 degrees out of phase and the outputs of the two tubes are combined by means of an output transformer having a center tap. The push-pull circuit arrangement is shown in figure 639A and the corresponding equivalent plate circuit that results is shown in figure 639D. So basically the push-pull does the negative half and the, and the positive half and then it combines it into a thing so you kind of get double. Output waveform of individual tubes. Waveform in load impedance after combining output of two tubes. So it's yeah, pretty interesting, isn't it? The advantage of the push-pull connection, assuming identical tubes, are one, no direct current saturation in the core of the output transformer. The direct currents in the two halves of the primary magnetize the core in opposite directions and so produce zero result in magnet magnetization. Oh, that's interesting. There is no current of signal frequency flowing through the source of plate power. This means the push-pull amplifier produces no regeneration even when there is a plate impedance common to the power and other stages. It also means that no bypass condenser is required across the cathode biasing resistor. Alternating current hum voltages present in the source of plate power produce no hum in the output because the hum currents are flowing in the two halves of the primary balance each other out. And there is less distortion for the same power output per tube or more power output per tube for the same distortion as a result of cancellation of all even harmonics and even order combination frequencies. Exciting systems for push-pull amplifiers. Characteristics of push-pull transformers for Class A amplifiers. Class B and Class AB audio frequency power amplifiers. Discussion of operating features of Class B amplifiers. Class AB amplifiers. The Class AB amplifier is a push-pull system in which the grid bias is adjusted to a value inter intermediate between that which would be used for a Class A power amplification and that which would be appropriate for a Class B power amplification. Under these conditions, the instantaneous plate current of each individual tube flows for more than half of each cycle, but becomes zero for a small portion of the cycle. This results in the current in the plate circuit of the individual tube being considerably distorted, but the action of the push-pull connection is such as to give an output wave in which the distortion is not excessive. Cathode follower amplifiers. The cathode follower amplifier, or as it is sometimes called, the cathode coupled amplifier, is widely used as a wideband or video frequency power amplifier. This type of amplifier, <coughs> in this type of amplifier, the load impedance is placed between cathode and ground, as shown in figure 643. Instead of between, yeah, instead of between the plate electrode and ground. This arrangement places one terminal of the load impedance at ground potential without the use of a blocking condenser, has an especially good response characteristic at high frequencies and has low amplitude distortion. Feedback amplifiers. In the feedback amplifier, a voltage derived from the amplifier output is superimposed on the amplifier input in such a way as to oppose the applied signal in the normal frequency range. By properly carrying out this operation, it is possible to reduce the distortion generated by the amplifier to make the amplification substantially independent of the electrode voltages and tube constants and to reduce greatly the phase and frequency distortion. A 
avoidance of oscillations in feedback systems. In order to realize the advantages of feedback, the amplifier and its feedback must be so arranged that oscillations do not occur. In the normal range of frequencies, no problem is presented because there is, <coughs> here the circuit arrangements are such that the feedback is negative. However, at both very low and very high frequencies, the amplifier stages produce phase shifts that cause the phase of the feedback vector A beta to differ from the phase corresponding to negative feedback. This introduces the possibility of a beta reversing its polarity, thus introducing positive feedback and directly assisting in the production of oscillations. To be unconditionally stable, that is, free of oscillations under all conditions, it is necessary that the circuit arrangement be such that under conditions when the phase shift of the feedback factor alpha A beta equals 180 degrees, the feedback factor alpha A beta will have a magnitude less than unity. It is apparent that in the design of the feedback system to avoid oscillation one need consider only the way in which the amplitude of transmission varies with frequency. Design of feedback systems to avoid oscillations. Practical feedback systems. I always think of Dave Jones and his t-shirt that says I only give negative feedback. I think he was wearing that one at the conference the other day. Typical feedback circuits involving a single stage of amplification. Practical feedback amplifier circuits. Control of effective internal impedance of amplifiers by feedback. Practical use of the feedback principle in audio frequency amplifiers. Miscellaneous considerations in untuned amplifiers. Volume control. Volume expansion and contraction. Regeneration in multi-stage audio and video frequency amplifiers. Under ideal conditions, the gain of a multi-stage amplifier is the product of the amplifications of the individual stages and the frequency response is therefore the product of the frequency response characteristics of the individual stages. Actually, this is true, however, only when there is no energy transferred between the stages. Such transfer is termed regeneration and is a form of uncontrolled feedback that may be either positive or negative depending on the circumstances. The tendency towards regeneration is more pr pronounced the higher the gain of the amplifier for then the fraction of the energy which transferred from the output to the input stage will have a significant effect is less. Thus, if the total voltage amplification is 100,000, 100, the ratio of powers at input and output points of the amplifier, assuming the same load resistance, is 10 to the power of 10. And it is obvious that even a small portion of the output energy transferred back to the input will be large in comparison with the input signal power that is being amplified. The most troublesome form of regeneration occurring in audio and frequency amplifiers is regeneration occurring at low frequencies when several stages of amplification operate from a common source of the plate power as shown in figure 658. Although power sources of this sort are ordinarily bypassed with large condensers, this bypassing becomes ineffective at quite low frequencies and the power supply system hence has an internal impedance for such frequencies that approaches the equivalent internal resistance determined on the basis of the regulation of the DC output voltage. 
although the regenerative, regenerative effects resulting from this situation are pronounced only at frequencies so low as normally to be outside the useful range of frequencies, the consequences are quite serious because they usually appear in the form of an oscillation having a frequency of fewer cycles per second, often referred to as motorboating. This situation can be looked upon as a form of feedback characterized by a feedback factor A beta, which has the same significance as in the negative feedback systems discussed in section 614. In analyzing this situation and in evaluating A beta, one need consider only the energy transfer from the last to the first stage of the amplifier. Feedback effects involving transfer of energy between other pairs of stages have negligible effects on comparison. In comparison, in the normal frequency range, a bit alpha beta. I think it is alpha beta. Is it alpha beta? Yeah. So a and alpha are the same character. So it's an alpha beta, I imagine. Sorry, I've been getting that wrong. You've probably been sitting there getting frustrated with me. In analyzing this situation and in evaluating alpha beta, one need consider only the energy transfer from the last to the first stage of the amplifier. Feedback effects involving transfer of energy between other pairs of stages have negligible effects in comparison. In the normal frequency range, alpha beta approaches zero because the bypass condensers in the power supply and in any decoupling filters are then extremely effective that is beta approaches zero but at very low frequencies these condensers no longer have a low reactance and the quantity beta representing the fraction of the amplifier output voltage that is fed back to the amplifier input stage becomes even larger even though the amplification alpha falls off at low frequencies if circuit proportions are such that the product alpha beta approaches unity that is if the energy transferred from the output of the amplifier system to the input is of the same order of magnitude as the energy present in the input stage in the absence of all feedback then oscillations can be expected a number of means are available for eliminating the tendency of motor boating to occur in amplifiers first the low frequency response of the amplifier should not extend to lower frequencies than is required. Below these frequencies, the amplification should preferably fall off as rapidly as possible. That is, alpha should drop rapidly at low frequencies. This can be accomplished by designing the amplifier stages so that their low frequency response so that their low frequency response does not extend to lower frequencies than called for by the design requirements. It is also desirable that whenever possible, the design of the plate coupling networks and the screen and bias impedances in the amplifiers be so coordinated as to give the sharpest possible cutoff at lower frequencies. Second, resistance capacitance decoupling filters such as R1C1 shown in figure 658 will reduce beta the reduction for a single such combination at the frequency omega on to pi being approximately uh, the amount of feedback with the filter divided by the amount of feedback without the filter, which equals one divided by blah, blah, blah. Results obtained from equation 674 are plotted in figure 659. There we go. And by making the capacitance C1s large, as is easily accomplished by using an electrolytic condensers and making R1 large, such as 100,000 ohms, one can obtain a suitable reduction even at frequencies of the order of a few cycles per second. Third, a source of plate potential having low internal impedance is very effective in reducing regeneration at low frequencies since this reduces the coupling between input and output stages. The internal Impedance can also be reduced by using separate filter systems, including separate chokes and condensers for the high and low power level stages of the amplifier, thereby reducing the amount of circuit resistance that is common. The use of a voltage regulated power supply such as described in section 1111 introduces coupling from the power supply to almost zero. Fourth, the use of push-pull amplification, particularly in final or power stage, is very helpful since in this way the amplified currents that are 
that flow through the common impedance of the power supply are merely the unbalanced currents between the two sides of the push-pull system and therefore are comparatively small. Finally, it is always possible to use separate power supplies for the high and low level portions of the amplifier, thereby eliminating all possibility of common coupling arising <coughs> through the power supply system. High frequency regeneration causing high frequency oscillations is occasionally encountered in audio frequency amplifiers. Such regeneration is almost always the result of electrostatic coupling between the input and output stages of the amplifier. These couplings result from failure to shield glass envelope tubes or from wiring poorly arranged so that there is appreciable electrostatic coupling between the input and output portions of the system, particularly portions that have a high impedance to ground. Hum. The term hum refers to alternating voltages appearing in the output of an amplifier as a, ser a result of the effect of power frequency voltages, currents and fields. In audio and video uh, frequency amplifiers, hum results from the introduction into the amplifier circuits of currents of uh, of currents of the power frequency and its harmonics which are amplified directly by the amplifier. Such hum is particularly troublesome in high gain systems since the then since then effects introduced in low level stages are subjected to large amounts of amplification. The possible sources of hum are stray magnetic fields, stray electrostatic fields, alternating currents in the heaters or filaments of the tubes and incompletely filtered power supply systems. The problem of avoiding hum while using alternating current to heat the cathode of a tube is discussed in section 11.1 and can be handled by a suitable choice of tubes. Hum from the power supply system is a design problem, the solution of which presents no particular difficulty. The hum that is most difficult to handle arises from stray magnetic and electrostatic fields. Microphonic effects. When a tube is jarred, the electrodes tend to vibrate mechanically, giving rise to effects characterized by the term microphonic action. Thus, vibrations cause changes in the plate current which are usually in the audible frequency range and which are, therefore, amplified in audio and video frequency amplifiers. Vibrations may be transmitted to the tube either mechanically through the tube socket or acoustically through the action of sound waves. Microphonic changes, <coughs> sorry, microphonic effects are most troublesome when tubes are operated in the vicinity of loudspeakers or when equipment is subjected to vibration as on airplanes, automobiles, etc. Microphonic effects can be minimized by preventing vibrations from reaching the tubes by selection of individual tubes for low microphonic action and by the use of special tubes of unusually rigid construction. Direct current, direct coupled amplifiers. Amplifier noise. Bandwidth of multi-stage audio amplifiers. Tune voltage amplifiers, narrow band case. Analysis of single tuned circuit amplifier, direct coupling. Analysis of single tuned circuits, transformer coupled case. Analysis of double tuned band pass amplifier circuits. Off channel selectivity. An important consideration in tuned voltage amplifiers is the amount of discrimination that is obtained against signals of frequencies differing slightly or moderately from the frequency of the signals to be amplified. The selectivity, that is the ability to discriminate <coughs> against off-channel signal, is commonly expressed in curves such as those of figure 710. 710, and there we go. Phase and time delay characteristics of tuned amplifiers. 
envelope delay. Tune amplifiers introduce a phase shift that varies with the frequency and so gives rise to time delay effects and time delay distortion in the same manner as in audio and video frequency amplifiers. Regeneration in multi-stage tuned amplifiers. Oh no, we've got some uh, water damage or something. Not sure what's happened there. So it's only on these two pages. <sighs> Amplitude distortion and crosstalk in tuned amplifiers. Tuned amplifiers, wideband case. Single tune wideband amplifiers. Staggered tuning. The effect of double tuned circuits can be obtained by using single tuned circuits and detuning the alternate stages. Input admittance of vacuum tube amplifiers. Input admittance of triode arising from interelectrode capacitance effects. Interelectrode capacitance effects. A positive input resistance means that energy is transferred from the grid to the plate through the grid plate capacitance, while a negative input resistance indicates that the phase relations are such that energy is transferred from the output or plate circuit of the tube to a grid circuit. The value of input resistance for the same application A and phase shift theta varies inversely as the frequency and may be very low at high frequencies. Neutralization of input admittance of vacuum tube amplifiers. Input admittance of pentodes. Self neutralized arrangements. Grounded grid circuits. Class C tuned amplifiers. The Class C tuned amplifier differs from the tuned voltage amplifiers of section 7.1 in that the bias is made greater than the cutoff value corresponding to the plate supply voltage so that when a signal is applied, the plate current flows in pulses that last for less than half a cycle. The Class C amplifier is characterized by high plate efficiency and is used to develop radio frequency power when a proportionality between input and output voltages is not required. Voltage, current and impedance relations in Class C amplifiers. Voltage, current and power relations in a typical Class C amplifier. Plate voltage, grid voltage, total space current, plate current, grid current, power relations in this, power relations in the grid circuit. Hmm. Power relations. The power delivered to the amplifier by the plate supply voltage at any instance is the product of instantaneous plate current and the supply voltage and so varies in the same way as does the instantaneous plate current as shown in figure 723G. Part of this input power is delivered to the tuned circuit and represents useful output <coughs> while the remainder is dissipated at the plate electrode of the tube. Factors involved in the design and operation of Class C amplifiers. Circuit arrangements and tank circuit considerations. The plate 
tuned circuit, commonly called the tank circuit, of a Class C amplifier is usually directly coupled as shown in figure 728A or is arranged with shunt feed as in figure 728B. The latter arrangement has the advantage that the coil and condenser are at ground potential for DC voltages, but since the shunt feed choke is effectively in parallel with the tuning coil, this choke must be a high inductance if it is not to carry an undue proportion of the circulating current of the resonant circuit. The load to which the output power is delivered may be directly, inductively, or capacitively coupled to the tank circuit. Push-pull circuits must be symmetrical on either side of the center tap in order to preserve the balance between the two tubes. Calculations of Class C amplifier performance. <sighs> design considerations. That's design considerations for a Class C. Design procedure for Class C amplifier employing triad tubes. Practical adjustment of Class C amplifiers. What do we got here? It's a big table. Characteristics of representative transmitting power tubes. All right. So these are just uh, specs. It's like a data sheet for a couple of tubes. Triodes mostly. Volts, amps, type, material, maximum plate dissipation in watts, method of cooling, mu, plate voltage, screen grid voltage, control grid bias voltage, peak signal voltage, DC plate current in milliamps, DC screen grid current in milliamps, DC control grid current in milliamps, driving power in watts, output in watts, plate efficiency percent. Wow, this can deliver 100,000 watts. <laughs> That's a lot of power. <sighs> Harmonic generators. Design and analysis of harmonic generator performance. That's interesting. Is it what it says on the tin? By taking advantage of the fact that the pulses of plate current have appreciable harmonic content, a Class C amplifier can be used to generate output power that is a harmonic of the exciting voltage applied to the control grid. It is merely necessary to tune the tank circuit to the desired harmonic and adjust the angle of flow of plate current to a value that is favorable for generating the harmonic involved. Harmonic generators of this character are frequently used in radio transmitters and for other communication purposes. Oscillation, oscillograms showing voltage, current, and power relations in a typical harmonic generator are shown in figure 730. There we go. Oscillogram. <clears throat> Linear amplifiers. A linear amplifier is a Class C amplifier so adjusted that the amplified output voltage that is developed is proportional to the exciting voltage applied to the amplifier. This is accomplished by making the bias of the tube correspond to protected projected cutoff as explained in connection with figure 642. The linear amplifier is the tuned equivalent of the Class B audio amplifier discussed in section 612, but differs in that it need not be push-pull because the tuned circuit eliminates the harmonics. The linear amplifier finds an important use as a power amplifier of amplitude modulated waves, as it is the most efficient means available increasing the power of an amplitude modulated wave without distorting the modulation. Design and adjustment of linear amplifiers. 
efficiency and power high efficiency linear amplifier Doherty amplifier class C and similar operations at ultra high frequencies transit time effects in tubes operated under class C and similar conditions Circuits for ultra high frequency class C and similar power amplifiers. Tubes and tube performance at ultra high frequencies. The traveling wave tube. The traveling wave tube is an amplifier that is particularly suitable for radio frequency amplification at very high frequencies, such as 3000 megacycles and higher. That's, uh, that's 3 gigahertz. The essential elements of a traveling wave tube are shown in figure 737. Vacuum tube oscillators. Conventional vacuum tube oscillator circuits. The basic os oscillator circuits. The Hartley, the Colpitts, the Tickler, <laughs> Tickler feedback tuned grid, actual circuit, equivalent circuits, tuned grid, tuned plate, schematic circuits of common types of power oscillators. Design and adjustment of power oscillators. Factors controlling starting and amplitude of oscillations. Intermittent operation, synchronization of vacuum tube oscillators, frequency and frequency stability of generated oscillation, oscillators with more than one resonant frequency, crystal oscillators. An unusually high degree of frequency stability, particularly over long periods of time, can be obtained by replacing the usual resonant circuit of an oscillator with a mechanically vibrating piezoelectric quartz crystal and utilizing the piezoelectric effect to establish a connection between the electrical circuits and the mechanical vibrations. Such crystal oscillators are the standard means of maintaining the frequency of radio transmitting stations at the assigned value and also find extensive use in the reception of CF signals from transmitter stations of specified frequencies as for example in connection with aircraft to ground radio communication. Piezoelectricity. Piezoelectric quartz crystals, when complete, have a hexagonal cro cross section with pointed ends as shown in figure 8, 4, and 8, 5. The properties of such a crystal can be expressed in terms of three sets of axes. The axis joining the points at the end of the crystal is known as the optical axis. The electricity Stresses applied in this direction produce no piezoelectro effect. The uh, three axis x, x1, x2, x3 are uh, passing through the corners of the hexagon that forms the section perpendicular to the upper, uh, known as blah 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 blah. It's going to tell you how a quartz crystal induces the piezoelectro effect. Uh, equivalent electrical circuit of vib vibrating quartz crystal. Resonant frequencies of crystals and effect of temperature. Ultra high frequency oscillators, resonant line oscillator circuits, butterfly oscillators. Butterfly oscillators make use of an ingenious type of resonant circuit termed a butterfly that has reasonably high Q and good stability and is capable of having the resonant frequency adjusted over a wide range without sliding contacts. 
Oh uh, yeah, I've seen these. They use them for tuning capacitors. Didn't know they were called a butterfly. Laboratory oscillators. Conventional oscillators with automatic amplitude control. Oscillators with resistance capacitance tuning. Circuit of resistance capacitance oscillator. Relative frequency, amplitude and phase characteristics. Phase shift oscillators. Resistance stabilized oscillators. Beat frequency oscillators. In the beat frequency oscillator, voltage is obtained from two radio frequency oscillators operating at slightly different frequencies are combined and applied to a detector or converter tube as shown in schematic figure 825. The output of the detector contains a difference frequency produced by heterodyne action as discussed in section 10.7, which after amplification represents the output of the oscillator. The practical value of the brief frequency oscillator arises from the fact that a small percentage variation in the frequency of one of the individual oscillators, such as can be obtained by the sig single turn of a dial controlling a variable condenser, will vary the beat or difference frequency output continuously from a few cycles per second through out the entire audio range or if desired through the entire video frequency range. At the same time the oscillator output can be made substantially constant as the frequency is varied by the simple process of maintaining the amplitude of the variable frequency oscillator constant over its small percentage range of variation. Parasitic oscillations. The term parasitic is applied to any undesired oscillation occurring in an oscillator or power amplifier. Examples of parasitic oscillations. <sighs> oh, in this one. Reflex klystrons. They said they had something to do with microwaves. Operating properties and characteristics of reflex chiston oscillators. Broadband operation of reflex chiston. Power klystron oscillators and frequency multipliers. Diagrams illustrating bunching of electron beam in klystron tubes. In this diagram, the reference electron is assumed to enter the drift tube at a time corresponding to the lower left hand corner of the diagram. The width of the various lines represents the variation of electron density with time at various distances along the drift tube with distance S prime representing the distance for maximum bunching effect. Magnetron oscillators. Description of cavity magnetron. Resonant modes in magnetrons and their separation. Electron paths under the influence of a DC anode voltage as the strength of the actual magnetic field varies. The paths shown are those followed when the magnetron is not oscillating. Typical electron paths in a magnetron under oscillating conditions, together with spokes showing configuration of rotating space charge. Get your head around that. Miscellaneous aspects of magnetron behavior. Split anode magnetron. Chapter 9, Modulation. 
waves with amplitude modulation. Plate modulated Class C amplifiers. Class C amplifier requirements. Modulator requirements. The power relations that exist in a plate modulated Class C amplifier can hence be summarized by stating that the power required to generate the carrier wave is supplied from the DC plate supply voltage, while the power required to generate the sideband components of the modulated wave must be supplied from the output of the modulator. Tubes for plate modulated Class C amplifiers. Miscellaneous systems of amplitude modulation. Grid modulated Class C amplifier. Modulated Class A amplifier. Vanderbilt modulator. I don't know how to pronounce that. Carrier suppression systems and single sideband generation. Balanced modulator. Vestigial sideband systems. Frequency modulated waves. Analysis of frequency modulated waves. Frequency spectrum of frequency modulated waves. Amplitude of frequency components of a frequency or phase modulated wave. In the case of the sidebands, the amplitude shown is the amplitude of the individual sideband component and not of the pair of companion sidebands taken together. Phase modulation. In phase modulation, the intelligence is transmitted by varying the phase of the radio frequency wave. For the case of sinusoidal waves modulation, the equation of the phase modulated wave is accordingly given in 912, where A is the amplitude of the wave, and so on. Combinations of phase, amplitude, and frequency modulation. Frequency and phase modulation are often combined with amplitude modulation as undesirable byproducts. For example, in the plate modulated oscillator, the plate supply voltage of the oscillator tube is varied in accordance with the modulating signal and since the generated frequency depends more or less upon the plate voltage, the oscillations actually generated possess, possess both frequency and amplitude modulation. For this reason, modulated oscillators are practically never used in radio communication. Combined phase and amplitude modulation can occur in a number of ways. The effect of frequency multiplication, frequency division and frequency translation upon frequency modulated waves. Uh, representation of amplitude, frequency and phase modulated waves by means of rotating vectors. There we go. You might want to press pause and have a good hard look at that one. Production of frequency and phase modulated waves. Frequency modulated oscillator using reactance tube modul modulator. Frequency modulators based on phase modulation. Response, response of networks to frequency modulated waves. Chapter 10, vacuum tube detectors and mixers. Detection of amplitude modulated waves. Diode detectors for amplitude modulated waves.
diode detectors with load impedance that depends on frequency. Input impedance of diode with load impedance that depends on frequency and demodulation of the applied signal. Practical diode detectors. Diode detectors as power converters. Miscellaneous methods for detection of amplitude modulated waves. Plate detection of large signals. Grid leak detectors. Square law weak signal detection. Crystal detectors. Vacuum tube voltmeters. Detection of frequency and phase modulated signals. Frequency translation, heterodyne detection. The term frequency translation refers to a shifting of the position that a signal occupies in the frequency spectrum without disturbing the modulation and hence the sidebands. An example of frequency translation would be a carrier frequency of one kilocycle voice modulated to plus minus 5,000 cycles transformed to a carrier frequency of 280 kilocycles with the same voice modulation. Such transformations are widely used in communications work. Frequency mixer and converter tubes for superheterodyne receivers. Mixer tubes. Quantitative analysis of mixer tubes. Crystal and diode mixes. Crystal mixes. Diode mixes. Noise in crystal and diode mixes. Miscellaneous. Oscillating detectors. Super regenerative detectors. Detection of single sideband signals. Behavior of detectors when applied signal consists of two modulated waves. The suppression of the weaker modulation is equivalent to an increase in the effective selectivity and represents an important property of a linear detector. Chapter 11. Sources of power for operating vacuum tubes. Cathode heating power. Alternating current hum in filament tube filament type tubes. Alternating current hum in heater type tubes. Control grid bias voltage. Sources of anode power. Rectifiers for supplying anode power. High vacuum thermionic rectifiers. Got a table here, characteristics of typical rectifier tubes. So it's a bit of a data sheet there. Uh, hot cathode mercury vapor rectifier tubes. Rectifier circuits. Single phase rectifier circuits. Polyphase circuits. Behavior of rectifiers when used with filter systems having series inductance input. Voltage and current relations in rectifier tubes. Figure 11.8. Voltage and current wave, shape, <coughs> wave shapes 
existing in rectifier systems operating with inductance input filters, assuming an idealized transformer with zero leaky leakage reactants. Another big table here, characteristics of typical rectifiers operated with inductance input filter systems. Input inductance requirements. Transformer considerations. Voltage regulation in input inductance systems. Behavior of rectifiers when used with filter systems having shunt condenser input. Mechanism of operation. Quantitative relations. Discussion of properties of shunt condenser systems. Figure 11.13, effect of circuit parameters on behavior of rectifier operated with condenser input filter. Figure 11.14, typical filters. Series inductance filters, shunt condenser filters, filters with series resistances. Filters. Voltage and current relations in filters. We've got uh, figure 11.15, reduction in ripple voltage produced by single selection inductance capacitance and resistance capacitance filters. Examples of rectifier filter calculations. Vibrator power supply systems. I wonder if it's like a switch mode power supply. Voltage regulated power supply systems. Miscellaneous aspects of tubes and circuits. Thermal agitation noise. Tube noise. Noise in pentode tubes. Another data sheet over here. Crystal mixer noise. Induced input circuit noise. Positive ion noise. Relaxation oscillators. In a relaxation oscillator, the action is controlled by the charge or discharge of a condenser or inductance through resistance. Such oscillators are characterized by highly distorted wave shapes, the frequency of which is readily controlled by voltages injected into the circuit. The usefulness of relaxation, relaxation oscillators arises from this ability to synchronize with an injected voltage from the special wave shapes that they produce and from the fact that the highly distorted waves are very rich in harmonics. The multivibrator. The flip-flop, isn't it? The multivibrator is a two-stage resistance coupled amplifier in which the voltage developed by the output of the second tube is applied to the input of the first tube as shown in figure 12a. Such an arrangement will oscillate because each tube produces a phase shift of 180 degrees, thereby causing the output of the second tube to supply to the first tube an input voltage that has exactly the right phase to sustain oscillations. One-shot multivibrators. In certain applications, it is required that the multivibrator be quiescent until its activation, its action is initiated by a pulse of voltage from an external source. The multivibrator then goes through one cycle of operation, after which it reverts to the original quiescent condition, providing the provided the initiating pulse is no longer present. Such an arrangement is called a one-shot multivibrator and can be realized by biasing the grid of one of the multivibrator tubes to a voltage more negative than cutoff for the plate supply potential employed. 
widely used form of one-shot multivibrator is shown in figure 12A, which differs from the multivibrator of 12.4a in that cathode coupling replaces grid leak condenser coupling in one of the amplifier stages. One shot operation is achieved by returning the grid of tube 2 to the plate supply voltage while the grid of tube 1 is returned to the cathode through a grid leak resistance. Under quiescent conditions, tube 2 carries a large plate current which causes the cathode of both tubes to be considerably positive with respect to ground thus causing tube 1 to be cut off. Blocking oscillators. Gas triode relaxation oscillator. Frequency division. Trigger circuits. Generation of special wave shapes. Clipping. Differentiating and integrating circuits. Square wave generators, pulse generators, gate pulses, frequency bands associated with special wave shapes, generation of time delays, counting circuits, Propagation of radio waves. General picture of factors involved in propagation of radio waves. The term sky wave refers to energy that is propagated in the space above the earth under conditions such as to be affected by the ionosphere, an ionized region which exists in the upper atmosphere above about 60 kilometers in height and which has the ability to refract radio waves back to Earth under many conditions. The sky wave accounts for long distance communication of all types, except at the very lowest freq radio frequencies, and this is the cause of variation in signal intensity between day and night, winter and summer, etc., in long distance signals. The ground wave. The ground wave glides over the surface of the earth. Space wave propagation with particular reference to very high frequencies. Analysis of space wave propagation over a flat earth. Effect of Earth Curvature Propagation Curves Fading of Space Wave Signals Troposphere Reflections Anomalous Propagation Reflection of Radio Waves When a plane wave strikes a surface such as the Earth, it is reflected with an angle of reflection equal to the angle of incidence. Yeah. The ionosphere. The energy radiated in directions other than along the ground surface travels through space until it reaches the ionized region in the upper atmosphere, where, if conditions are favorable, the path of the wave will be bent earthward. Physical mechanism by which ionosphere affects radio wave propagation. The effect of the Earth's magnetic field. Losses in the ionosphere. Theory of sky wave propagation. Vertical incidence refraction, critical frequency. Relation of oblique incidence transmission to vertical incidence transmission. Virtual height. 
One of the most important quantities in skywave transmission problems is the effective or virtual height. This is the height of a reflecting surface in free space for which the travel time of the wave is equal to the time, travel time of the wave in the actual ionized medium. In the case of vertical incidence transmission, the vertical height is the distance obtained by multiplying the velocity of light by one half the time required for a pulse of radio energy to travel up to the ionosphere and back. Maximum usable frequency, skip distance. Reflection of wave by ionosphere. Sky wave attenuation. Scattering of radio waves. Measurement of ionosphere characteristics. Propagation characteristics of radio waves of different frequencies in relation to the problems of practical radio communication. Propagation characteristics of radio waves in the frequency range 20 to 100 kilocycles. Propagation characteristic of radio waves in the frequency range 100 to 550 kilocycles. Propagation characteristics of broadband waves 500 to 2000 kilocycles. Propagation characteristics of short waves, frequency range 2 to 30 megacycles. Propagation of frequencies above 30 megacycles. Relation of solar activity and meteorological conditions to the propagation of radio waves. Noise and static. Means of overcoming static. Precipitation static. Rayleigh Carson reciprocity theorem. There are various reci reciprocal relations that relate the properties of waves traveling in one direction to the properties of waves traveling in the opposite direction and similarly connect the properties possessed by an antenna when transmitting with the properties possessed in reception. These relations are incorporated in reciprocal theorems, the most important of which was formulated by Rayleigh and extended to include radio communications by John R. Carson. It is to the effect that if an electromotive force E inserted in antenna 1 causes a current I to flow at a certain point in a second antenna 2, then the voltage E applied at this point in the second antenna will produce the same current I in both magnitude and phase at the point in antenna 1 where the voltage E was originally applied. The Rayleigh-Carson theorem fails to be true only when the propagation of the radio waves is appreciably affected by the presence of the Earth's magnetic field. It thus holds for all practical radio work except for long-distance communication utilizing frequencies in the range 2 to 30 megacycles and involving the ionosphere. Even then, it can be expected to apply to results averaged over a reasonable interval of time, even though it cannot be depended upon to be exactly correct at every given moment. The importance of the Rayleigh-Carson theorem in radio wave propagations arises from the fact that it is shown that in radio communication between two fixed points, the same behavior as to signal strength, optimum frequency, etc. is to be expected irrespective of which end of the circuit is the transmitting end and which is the receiving end. The Rayleigh-Carson theorem also has important implications in connection with the transmitting and receiving properties of antennas as discussed in section 14. 11. 14. Antennas. Fundamental considerations relating to radiation from wires. Induction fields. Fundamental considerations in the directional characteristics of antenna systems composed of wire radiators remote from ground.
radiation characteristics of non-resonant wire remote from ground radiation characteristics of a pair of spaced antennas <clears throat> the broadside principle the broadside principle is that radiation can be concentrated in a plane by placing a number of radiators equally spaced along a line perpendicular to this plane and carrying identical currents of the same phase in all radiators. Such an arrangement of antennas is termed a broadside array. The end fire principle. In the end fire array, a number of identical antennas carrying currents of equal amplitude are arranged along a line and excited so that there is a progressive phase difference between adjacent antennas equal in cycles to the spacing between the antennas expressed in wavelengths. Such an arrangement will produce a directional pattern in which the radiation is concentrated in the direction toward which the end of the array having the most lagging current is pointed. The turnstile principle. In the turnstile antenna, two half wave resonant wire radiators are placed crosswise in the same plane and excited 90 degrees out of phase with each other. The directional patterns of the individual antennas in the plane of the system are illustrated in figure 1413. Since the individual radiations are in time quadrature, the total radiation in any direction from the system is the square root of the sum of the squares of the radiations from the individual antennas in that particular direction and so has the roughly circular character shown below. The field radiated in a direction at right angles to the plane of the turnstile array is circularly polarized. Loop antennas. The loop antenna, <laughs> the loop can be thought of as a coil carrying a radio frequency current as shown in figure 1414a. A loop intended for use at high frequencies may have only a single turn, while lower frequency loops may be constructed with many turns. Under ordinary uh, circumstances, the loop dimensions are small compared with the wavelength, and the current in the wires of the loop is everywhere substantially the same. Effect of ground, ground antennas, grounded antennas. Grounded antennas. Typically examples of grounded antennas are shown in figure 1420. Here we go. Arrays of arrays, array factors. Antenna impedance, mutual impedance and phasing. Mutual impedance, voltage and current relations in systems involving coupled antennas. Balance to unbalance transformation. Impedance matching systems for matching transmitting antennas to feed lines. Phasing of radiators in antenna arrays. Power relations in antennas, radiation resistance, directivity and gain, antenna resistance, calculation of radiated power and radiation resistance, gain of directional antenna systems, Gain in anten antenna systems involving low mutual impedance between elements. Some directional systems of particular interest. Directional systems involving parasitic antennas, Yagi antennas. V antennas. The V antenna is illustrated in figure 437. A V antenna showing how the radiation from the two legs combines to give a well-defined beam. Rhombic antennas. Fishbone antennas. 
aperture radiators horn antennas lens antennas broadband consideration in transmitting antennas practical transmitting antennas transmitting antennas for broadcast frequencies 550 to 2000 kilocycles Transmitting antennas for 20 to 30 megacycles. Transmitting antennas for frequency range 30 to 600 megacycles or 0 0.5 to 5 meters wavelength. <sighs> Transmitting antennas for frequencies higher than 600 megacycles. Microwave transmitting antennas. Fundamental properties of receiving antennas and reciprocal relations existing between transmitting and receiving properties. Reciprocal relations between receiving and radiating properties of antenna systems. Practical receiving antennas. Receiving antennas for broadcast and lower frequencies. Shortwave receiving antennas. Receiving antennas for very short wavelengths. Chapter 15. Radio transmitters, receivers and communication systems. Transmitters. General considerations. Amplitude modulated transmitters for radio telephone and similar applications. Broadcast transmitters. Shortwave and ultra high frequency radio telephone transmitters. Negative feedback in radio telephone transmitters. Audio frequency systems of radio telephone transmitters. Frequency modulated transmitters for radio telephone and similar signals. Frequency modulated transmitters using reactance tube modulators. Negative feedback in frequency modulated transmitters. Radio telegraph transmitters. Frequency shift keying. An alternative to on-off keying is to use one frequency for the mark intervals and another for the spacing intervals. The frequency shift that is required must be at least several times the bandwidth required for transmitting the same signal by on-off keying and is preferably considerably greater in order to realize the advantages of noise suppression inherent in frequency modulation. Such frequency shift keying can be obtained in many ways. Radio receivers, general considerations. Radio frequency, oscillator and first detection section, intermediate frequency section, second detector, audio frequency section, loudspeaker. Schematic diagram of super heterodyne receiver. Specification of receiver characteristics. Broadcast receivers. Receivers for standard broadcast band. Receivers for the reception of shortwave amplitude modulated broadband signals or broadcast signals. Receivers for the reception of ultra high frequency frequency modulated broadcast signals. Look at that. Simplified circuit diagram of frequency modulation broadcast receiver.
Wow. Miscellaneous features relating to broadcast receivers. <clears throat> Tracking and alignment of circuits for single dial control. Muting system. Spurious responses in super heterodyne receivers. Receivers and receiver techniques for other than broadcast purposes. Triple detection receivers. Automatic frequency control. Receivers with crystal controlled load oscillators. Crystal filters. Noise suppressors for amplitude modulated signals. Single sideband receivers. Communication receivers. Special considerations involved in code reception. Diversity systems for minimizing fading. Microwave receivers. Receiver noise. Signal to noise ratio of an ideal receiving system. Noise in practical receivers. Noise and interference reduction in frequency modulation systems. Common channel interference and cross modulation. Pulse communication systems. Methods of transmitting intelligence by pulses. Pulse position modulation is not the only means by which pulses may be used to transmit intelligence. Time multiplex. Signal to noise ratio. Radio delay systems. Chapter 16, radio aids to navigation and radar. Radar. The term radar is derived from the first letters in the phrase radio detection and ranging. Radar is essentially an echo ranging system in which the existence of an object is determined by ex observing radio waves reflected from it. Elements of a radar system. Frequency and power used in radar. Maximum range of a radar set. Radar transmitting systems. Modulators. Radar antennas. Lobe switching, effective ground on radar antenna characteristics, duplexes, TR box, radar receiving systems, radar receivers, PPI presentation showing Cape Cod as viewed by a radar in an airplane. Cool. PIP matching. Radar beacons. Beacon navigation system, Showran. Pulse navigation systems, low RAN and G. G. G is a 25 equals 85 MC navigational system using the same principles as low RAN. 
A typical G system is shown schematically in figure 1619. Okay, just does uh, triangulation by the looks of it. Radio altimeters. Radio range. VHF omnidirectional radio range. Airplane landing systems. Instrument landing system. Ground controlled approach. Radio direction finding. Loop direction finders. Errors in loop bearing. Night effect. A loop antenna will give correct bearings only when no horizontally polarized downcoming waves are present. Adcock antenna. Chapter 17, television, elements of a system of television, television pickup tubes, iconoscope, orthicon, the orthicon, short for ortho-iconoscope, meaning linear iconoscope, is a modification of the iconoscope that avoids secondary electron effects. Oh dear me, oh, I'm nearly there. Image orthicon. Scanning, synchronizing, <coughs> scanning, synchronization and blanking. Scanning. Synchronization. Must have missed banking, where was banking? Standard signal for television transmitters. The United States standards call for a resulting modulation envelope having the character illustrated in figure 1715. Figure 1715, standard envelope for a modulated carrier according to United States television standards. It's pretty complicated, isn't it? This is a uh, big block diagram. Simplified schematic diagram illustrating how the synchronizing and blanking pulses required in the standard television signal may be generated. Wow. Frequency band and resolution. It's going to take a quick break. Oh my go. Almost finished. So, uh, frequency band and resolution, television transmitters, television receivers, color television. Several successful systems have been devised for transmitting television signals in color and at the present time this is a field of active experimentation. Characteristics of audible sounds. Sorry, this is chapter 18, sound and sound equipment. Characteristics of audible sounds. Speech. Music, 
noise well, there's actually an interesting table here table 18 1 <clears throat> instrument 36 by 15 inch bass drum power 26 watts percentage of one-eighth of a second intervals in which power is at least one-fourth of peak band containing maximum peaks cycles per second snare drum cymbals saxophone french horn piccolo piano 75 piece orchestra wow noise, I'm not sure if I mentioned noise characteristics of the human ear elements of acoustics effects of distortion in the reproduction of sound dynamic loudspeakers employing paper cones Analysis of dynamic speaker action. Miscellaneous considerations. Horns. Performance of horn speakers, directional baffles, loud speakers, miscellaneous considerations, acoustic labyrinths, resonators, etc., high frequency speakers, the telephone receiver. Magnetic diaphragm telephone receiver. Moving coil telephone receivers. Microphones, carbon microphone. Condenser microphone. The condenser microphone is a condenser in which one plate is fixed while the other is a diaphragm against which the sound waves act. A direct current potential of several different volts is several hundred volts is applied between the plates of the condenser and as the capacitance is varied by the vibrations that the sound waves produce in the flexible plate a corresponding voltage drop is produced in the high resistance that is placed between the DC voltage and the microphone as shown in figure 1821 so the condenser in condenser microphones actually referring to a capacitor and they didn't rename that part of the capacitor moving coil microphone the ribbon or velocity microphone unidirectional microphones pressure and field response characteristics and there we go problems <coughs> Oh, these are actually problems and not um, answers to problems. The first one is, if in figure 2, 1, the flux shown is produced by a current of 0 0.01 amps, estimate the coil inductance. Assume that figure 2, 1 gives a two-dimensional representation of the total number of flux lines in the three-dimensional coil. Wow. Are we going to take a close look at these? Uh, two two. A single layer coil is to have an inductance of 200 microhenries and is to be wound on a form having a diameter of 2 inches. If the ratio of length to diameter is 1.5, determine the number of turns per inch of the winding. 2 3. A single layer solenoidal coil having 60 turns on a winding 3 inches long and 3 inches in diameter 
Possessing an inductance of 187 microhendries without using figure 2-2, two, two, A. How many turns would be required to obtain the same inductance if the core were in two inches were two inches in diameter and two inches long? How many turns would be required to obtain an inductance of an inductance of 400 microhenries with a winding four inches long and four inches in diameter? Ah. What do we got here? Fill in the blanks in the following table. That's cool. And here we are at the index. I don't think I'll read out the whole index. But we certainly covered a lot of ground, didn't we? There we have it. Done. We did the whole thing. So, uh, <clears throat> this video looks like it's going to run for about uh, five hours. So, uh, that's a pretty long video. Um, in the uh, in the show notes, I'll, uh, I'll put in a, a little note about how to run the video at three times speed on YouTube which you, uh, you might want to do. The user interface only allows you to do up to two times speed, but I do sometimes watch videos at three times speed. It, yeah. um, and of course, uh, you won't hear this until you get to the very end, so hopefully you read the show notes before you started watching, or else you won't know. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that, that concludes this video. Uh, if you made it all the way to the end, congratulations, well done, that's awesome. Uh, let me know, say hello in the comments. And um, uh, I, I guess I don't have that much to say in the show notes. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll probably make a couple of notes, but probably not many. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll be back soon with, uh, with, with the other features that I'll be doing. I'm going to be doing the new mini project soon. We'll do the first one of those. And uh, I do have a new book teardown coming up. And of course, the Maxitronic Sensor Robot. We continue to work our way through that. So. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks very much for watching, and please remember to hit like and subscribe.